Pio, can you repeat to me once again your opinion on taxation? Taxation is theft, and Euron did nothing wrong. Yeah, there were a couple of people that were looking for you exactly because of that. The Italian IRS will never have me alive. The lore of Pio deepens. The Imperium is a weak old man, ready and waiting to be broken apart by his vengeful sons. Okay, for the moment my tax problem has been dealt with, Black Templars style. But taking away attention from a dark backstory, are we still on the Badabur? Yes, we are. This is part 3 out of 4. Good. Can we have a fast recap for the POs of the audience, including me? In part 1 of this series, we covered the events leading up to the war. In part 2, we covered from the start of the war all the way to the heresy of Euron and the Astral Close being uncovered, the Lamenters being defeated, and we ended just before the second and worst part of the war, the assault on Badab itself. Ah yes, the extremely interesting tax war of 40k. I suggest once again to go and watch the first two parts of this series to have a full picture of the events that will unfold, even because in this video we will explain everything up until the end of the war. Our story resumes in 909 and 41. At this point, the Badab War has been raging for six years, and it all started as an attempt by Lufty Euron, chapter master of the Astral Close and self-proclaimed tyrant of Badab, to assert the independence of his chapter and the warders of the Maelstrom from the authorities of the Segmentum in which the Maelstrom Zone is located. But instead, the only thing it achieved was revealing to the Imperium the treachery and heresy of the Astral Close chapter, and the full might of the Imperium was now fighting against Euron at the doors of his own domain. Karab Kuln and the Loyalist forces were still fighting sporadically on the borders of the Endymion Cluster, where elements of the Fire Angels and Sons of Medusa were fighting to contain the Mantis Warriors to the edges of the Chimaran Drift and the Pale Stars. While in the Pale Stars, the ships of the Executioner's Chapter still fought with relentless ferocity against the Red Scorpions and Minotaur's Chapters. At this stage of the war, the Loyalists needed time to prepare for the ferocious campaign that was approaching to defeat Euron and put an end to the Badab War, but to do so, they needed fresh reinforcements and fast, as they knew they could not afford to wait too long before resuming the offensive against the traitors. Meanwhile, Euron and his forces had suffered numerous defeats that had pushed them back from their once mighty empire and starved them of much of their strength with each battle they fought. The Lamenters had been defeated, the Executioners acted of their own volition, the Mantis Warriors were completely cut off, and the Astral Claws were in the aim of the Inquisition for their heresy in exceeding voluntarily the 1000 Marines limit imposed by the Codex Astartes, and they were suffering an extreme scarcity of heavy warships to use to fight against the Imperium. Even the Astral Claws, that had sustained enough losses to wipe out an entire chapter, were now a mixed bag of bloody veterans and untrained neophytes preparing to face the Imperium and all the space Marine chapters that were ready to march against Badab. The first days on 910 and 41 proved to be the final moments of calmness before the end of the war, and even this moment of respite would be short lived, as the fighting would resume in an even more brutal fashion in a military operation known as the Subjugation of Galen. 017, 910 and 41. The relatively isolated Galen system had been a prize that had been battled over repeatedly, and had changed hands between Loyalist and Secessionist control several times. The most significant battle fought in the Galen system was fought between the Firehawks chapter and a mixed Secessionist assault force. In this battle, that caused heavy losses for both Loyalists and Secessionists, the life-supporting domes of the planet of Galen Second had been laid to waste, leading to a mass refugee immigration to its neighboring planet, the Arscrabble world of Galen Sixth, that was by this point of the war in 910 and 41, the last habitable world of the entirety of the Galen system. Galen Sixth was a near-dead world of metallic salt flats studded with open-cast mines, industrial sprawls, and now ramshackle refugees refugee camps, filled with the refugees of the shattered colonies across the system. Galen VI resources had been stretched beyond their breaking point by the influx of refugees, and now the world was rife with famine and malcontent. 
In the wake of his most recent liberation by the loyalist side, a detachment of Ordo Hereticus forces under the control of Inquisitor Taria Shard had arrived to conduct an investigation into the secessionist activities while they were in control of the system, to weed out and punish collaborators in the civilian population's ranks. Based on Galen's sixth capital, known in local parlance simply as the Old City, the Ordo Hereticus detachment was both reviled and feared by the locals, and maintained a stranglehold on the planet by the the direct control of the old city's water purification plants on which hundreds of thousands of refugees relied for their drinking water to survive. Ah yes, a classic savior and good guy move. Keep the entire planet hostage by taking direct control of the supply of water of the planet. Classic Inquisition behavior. I've already seen something similar in the past. Oh yeah? Where? Yes, my fellow Christians! We have come to save you! Hooray! It's the Catholic Church! From yourselves! Oh no, it's the Catholic Church! Something totally serious, but that I will not discuss further. In any case, quite predictably, it was not long before a civil insurrection started, but what was unexpected was the sheer fury and degree of organization the uprising showed. Simultaneous with a popular rebellion in the camps, the city warders and industrial guilds also entered into armed revolt against their just masters, with the intent of throwing off imperial control and remaining independent of both loyalists and secessionists, with the general belief that both sides had brought them nothing but bloodshed and misery. The simple fact that the people of Galen VI had deluded themselves into believing this was a possible outcome at the center of such a violent war is perhaps a testament to the horrors they had suffered. Within hours of the revolt's beginning, much of the Imperial garrison, which comprised a single indentured Imperial Guard regiment and a detachment of stormtroopers, had been overwhelmed. The whole city was in flames, and violence against those who supported either power of the war started. But as expected, the cohesion of the rebellion refugees would not last, and once they had achieved their objectives, their victory devolved into blind mass murder and looting by rival factions fighting each other. Soon, the refugee camps had dissolved into an anarchy of gangs, killing each other over scraps of food in the cities and sprawls. When word of the events that took place reached the Loyalist High Command, Legate Inquisitor Jarndyce Frain was with to declare the Galen system apostate, having been first liberated from secessionist control, and then having turned willfully from the Emperor's grace. Thus, the fate of Galen VI was sealed. The bulk of the Loyalist Sons of Medusa Chapter forces, then undergoing redeployment from around Cygnax to forward positions, were diverted to bring back order on Galen VI. They did so under the direct command of Carab Kuln, and were accompanied by an Ordo Hereticus detachment under Inquisitor Kramner, one of Frain's personal aides. Kuln's orders were direct and explicit. The Galen system was to be brought as swiftly as possible back under Imperial control, and any hope of future resistance crushed immediately. The only caveats of the order were that the planet was to remain habitable, and a sufficient core of the population and infrastructure was to be left alive and intact to service the needs of the Imperial war effort. Under Commander Violent Kal, the Sons of Medusa arrived in orbit of the planet, and they targeted and bombarded the pre-chosen landing zones on the outskirts of the old city, rendering them little more than craters of smoking rubble. Into these ravaged zones, the Space Marines made the three company strength landing assaults on the edge of Galen sixth old city, encircling and destroying any immediate resistance on landing with ease. For three days and nights, the Sons of Medusa remained within the shattered craters, landing supplies and troops and fabricating new fortifications and bastions, which rose up from the dust and smoke like jagged teeth sliding from a predator's jaws. Within the old city, the tide of intercommunal violence ended, and a new wave of fear began to descend over the sprawling cityscape and its several million surviving inhabitants. All had seen and heard the fury of the bombardment from the spires of the city, and seen the fiery trails of landing crafts, and many could guess just what they pre-announced. On the dawning of the fourth day, an unnatural and near total silence had fallen over the old city, filled with dread at what was to come. Such fear was a calculated weapon in the hands of the Sons of Medusa, and they did not disappoint the expectation of terror they had created. 
Armored columns of Rhino and Razorback transports, thundering land raiders, and the hulking figures of Drennaus stalked out of the dust clouds, while the droning shadows of land speeders took to the skies, like flocks of carrion crows above. Alongside the green livery of the Sons of Medusa vehicles was dotted the crimson of the Inquisition, and from their chimeras and repressors low dealers, they demanded the immediate surrender of all of Galen's sixth population for immediate judgment. Those that had taken up arms knew that for them there would be little mercy shown. Some hurled themselves against the embodiment of the Emperor's wrath, only to be ruthlessly destroyed by the Sons of Medusa in open battle, while others cowered in hastily prepared defensive positions or sought to hide or flee the city. Those that tried to escape were slaughtered at the old city's borders, cut down by patrolling land speeders and vulture gunships as they tried to break out across the open ground to the perceived safety of the dust barrens. Soon the roadways out of the old city were choked with the burnt out wrecks of ground cars, and adult piles of sprawled and torn bodies. Within the city those that offered serious resistance were isolated and then destroyed, barricaded up blocks and manufactura offering little protection from the merciless skill and power of the space marines. Entire city towers toppled, their lower floors blasted out by concentrated fire from demolisher cannons and melter strikes, burying their defenders and those unfortunates caught with them in the rubble, while fires ravaged the ruins. Only the shattered and abject were spared, all but ignored by the giants that stalked the dust fog. The fresh civilians waited for death to reach out for them, but the sons of Medusa stayed their hands as they had been ordered. Many were reported to have wept openly in joy to be taken up by the Inquisition's foot soldiers for processing and judgment, and extant peak captures from the aftermath showed line upon line of grey streaked hallowed eyed men and women, passively awaiting their fate in the Holy Ordo's Assizes bastions built in the Imperial landing zones. Within 56 hours of the commencement of the Sons of Medusa attack, the whole city was firmly in the hands of the Imperium. Just as they had planned, news of the massacres had spread across Galen VI, and a shroud of terror now tightened around the planet. First hundreds, then thousands, and then soon in millions, the people of Galen VI, native and refugee alike, surrendered, even though many faced death in doing so, rather than live in the fear of what was to come. Inquisitor Shard was discovered to have survived, but had been terribly wounded by the explosion of a bomb, her life preserved by her faithful coterie of acolytes, and was returned to Inquisitor Cramner. Once she was restored by the tech marines of the Sons of Medusa with mechanical replacements, she was placed in charge of the court proceedings, and their judgments were both swift and final, and soon the entirety of the old city ruins were repurposed and rebuilt as an internment and processing center to handle Galen VI's population. Overall, the Galen campaign was considered to be a complete success, and although much of the population of the old city had been slain, the total death toll was light compared to that which would have been the result of a lengthy planet-wide campaign of attrition. While the worst recidivist and heretical elements found on the planet were delivered to the Pyre, the Ordo Hereticus was merciful, and indentured the majority of the planet's population into a lifetime of penal servitude to pay for their crimes and transgressions. As a result, a number of fresh penal legions were raised for the Departamento Munitorum from the most hardened elements found on the world, while the rest were set to work, either toiling on Galen VI itself or deported to aid the rebuilding efforts elsewhere in the Maelstrom Zone. The Sons of Medusa soon departed Galen VI, leaving it a prison world whose people would pay for their crimes against the Imperium for generations to come. And all of this, might we remind everyone, was done by the good guys of the war, and usually of the setting. The Imperium are the good guys in perspective to the universe of 40k, but they aren't good by any moral standard we have, they do what must be done. I think that if the Inquisition tried to help instead of keeping the population hostage with their water and the threat of prosecution for heresy, all of this might have been avoided. Are you trying to use logic in the Inquisition? You are not beating the Alfarius allegations after this one, Pio. I'm not Alfarius, I am Omegon. Three two seven nine one zero and forty one. 
unexpectedly, a single fire blackened space marine strike cruiser, bearing an unknown livery and transmitting a previously unknown Vox identity cipher, exited the warp on the outer reaches of the Cygnax system. It was the Levitus Vex, and its coming was to herald the arrival of a force whose name was to become synonymous with bloodshed, and the darkest acts of the entire Badab War. The vessel, making contact with Imperial ships set to monitor Cygnax space, identified itself with ancient, although still valid, Imperial authorization protocols. It announced the arrival of a Space Marine force come to offer their swords to the Loyalist cause against the heretics, claiming to have come in answer to summons from Holy Terra itself. They identified their chapter with a simple yet foreboding name. They were the Carcharodon Sastra. Oh, fuck. After a fearful standoff, the naval ships sent communications back to the Loyalist Center Command, and upon confirmation that the vessel was but the forerunner of an entire fleet of vessels now traversing the edge of the Golgotan Wastes, a formal deputation was dispatched to meet with the head of this war fleet under the direct command of Legate Inquisitor Jandai's Frain himself, to ascertain his true intentions. Frain's delegation, which contained his ablest servants and savants of Adeptus Astartes lore, along with a lifeguard chosen from the Fire Angels chapter and several powerful Imperial Navy vessels, met with the oncoming Carcharodon's fleet at the Dead Star of Null 17, in the interstellar void beyond Cygnax. The precise details of this conference have remained a secret, but the outcome of this meeting was that the Carcharodons were allowed to take part in the Badab War. Let's see them introduced, so we can give a payoff to the people left hanging from the ending of part 2. The Carcharodons are a mysterious space marine chapter with a dark reputation. Considered strangers in this war by friend and foe alike, they arrived from the Black Void beyond the Imperium's border. They have no real records indicating they exist at all, almost like specters appearing on the battlefields of the Imperium. They are of an unknown founding, but mutations observed on unhelmeted marines of the chapter make genetists of the Imperium theorize that they are of Raven Guard descendants, with their dark grey skin and deep black eyes. The chapter was observed to be extremely violent, especially concerning melee combat, with all its members carrying melee weapons, no matter their designation on the battlefield. A thing, though, that made friend and foe alike terrified of the chapter was their ability to seemingly erupt from absolute stillness to savage fury without warning. To then withdraw like ghosts from the battlefield should events not go the favorable way. But, an experience that signed everyone fighting against them or alongside them was the eerie silence all of their marines kept during attacks. Their officers' commands issued via locked and encrypted Voxnet. Not a word or sound were being uttered during the battle, save for extreme necessity. Disciplined as marines, even if easy to erupt in bloodlusty violence, they preferred to stay locked in their solitude, avoiding contact with other marines save for extreme necessity necessity. They were also observed to be extremely religious, sparing from their attacks only places of worship and considered sacred to the Imperial cult. From the fleet that was arriving to Badab, it can be estimated that their entire chapter was coming to Badab for war. Wait, the entire chapter? Does that mean their chapter master is here too? Yes, as I hinted at the end of the last video, he is here to lead this chapter in battle directly. Damn, I'm starting to feel bad for the traitors. Nobody would ever want to face their chapter master even casually, let alone in open combat. The chapter master of the Carcharodon Sastra at the time of the Badab War, and that will need a deeper explanation just to make people understand how dangerous of an individual he is, was none other than the Hand of Death itself, the towering monster of a warrior known as Tiberos the Red Wake. Tiberos, on the contrary of whatever the other lore youtubers spout, isn't a primarch sized giant among Astartes as described, and his armor, at least from what I have read from the novels and Carcharodon's books, isn't modified with pieces of Drenout armor. That is all false info given by ignorance on the matter by people that barely know the lore. But he is still taller than normal marines, described as standing ahead above the rest, even if compared to other marines clad in tactical Drenout armor, also known as Terminator armor. If you want to read more, more info is given in the book Outer Dark by Robbie McNiven, specifically in Chapter 1. 
Tiberos might be the most dangerous space marine to ever fight in the Badab War and in many other battlefields. He is renowned for his brutal combat prowess, leading his first company Terminators in bloody assault after bloody assault from his battle barge, named Nikor. His savagery unmatched in the entirety of the Badab War. He was never seen outside of his archaic suit of Terminator armor. Those that saw his face described it as a corpse white nightmare, with half the bones of the face exposed in a bloodless grimace, his eyes a soulless, depthless black. Those that witnessed him in combat and lived to tell the tale spoke of him as a blood splattered killing machine, moving almost too fast for the eye to see, and that he leaves nothing but mangled corpses in his wake. Yet it appeared that he was acting with precise and deadly intention in combat, as if every strike was called and calculated beforehand, rather than a product of mere rage. His dark symbol were the power weapons he wielded in battle, the two unique relic gauntlets named Hunger and Slake, ancient chain fists equipped with additional barbed power blades. These weapons are of a pattern and manufacture unknown even to the adepts of Mars. The thing that made Tiberos terrifying for both friend or foe was that whenever he spoke, he did so only with a dark and low whisper, a whisper that most often than not pre-announced that death was coming. Damn, so you're telling me this artwork isn't at all accurate? No, it isn't. He's bigger than normal Terminators, but here he's Primark size. And also another thing, what's with all the fan arts having one of the power claws turned off? This power claw is clearly unpowered, and it is unpowered because in this artwork Tiberos is going to fight a Mantis warrior with a single arm, so he's even in the playing field by using only one of his weapons. Yes, the Astarte Terminator armor is even in the playing field against the Astarte normal power armor and with just one arm, but turning off just one of his weapons. He should also take off a couple of tons of armor to even begin to make things fair. For the love of all that is sacred, stop drawing him in fan art with one power claw turned off. It was a one-time thing. From their arrival, Lord Commander Karab Kuhn was wary of these new marines that had just joined the Loyalist forces, particularly given the independent reports from the Fire Angels who had accompanied Frayne, which painted the Karcharodons as barbarous and aberrant, with little to commend that even resembled the dictates of the Codex Astartes. But he didn't speak against Legat Inquisitor Frayne, and in truth, the Loyalists were in need of reinforcements if they were to press the attack in a timely fashion. After some deliberation, Kuhn dispatched the Karcharodons to the ongoing campaign against the secessionist and renegade worlds of the Endymion Cluster, in order to prove their worth. 360, 910, and 41. The Badab War had placed the Mantis Warriors chapter in a difficult position. As one of the Maelstrom Warder chapters, they had allied themselves with Euron and his Astral Claws at the outset of the secession, being both true to their bonds of blood and alliance with their fellow Warders, and insensed with what they saw as the Administratum wanton breach of authority and protocol over the political matters of the earlier Badab schism. However, as the war progressed, it appears they began to harbor grave doubts about the tyrant's motives and the increasingly dark practices of the Astral Close chapter, particularly after the mysterious death of their own chapter master, Yarvan Sartak, during the betrayal at Griff. By this point of the war, they had spilled the blood of many loyal space marines and were held responsible for the first armed conflict between Astartes of the entire war. Worn down by casualties and losses in warships, and increasing distrust for their former close allies, the Mantis warriors by this point of the war found themselves largely isolated within the familiar battlegrounds of the stars and worlds of the Endymion Cluster, a region of space that had long been theirs to defend. Using their great familiarity with these star systems and worlds, the endemic loyalty of their people to their ancient protectors, and the long-standing series of hidden bastions they maintained here, the Mantis warriors had successfully fallen back into a seemingly unassailable position. Here the chapter played to its great strengths and expertise, fighting guerrilla campaigns against numerically superior foes, and frequently employing iterant tactics, raids and ambushes. Such was their power and skill here that they successfully fended off Stormtrooper regiment-backed detachments from both Fire Angels and Sons of Medusa, sent to hound them in a series of protracted actions and engagements which became known as the Tranquility Campaign, after the Tranquility System, where its most frequent and costly battles were fought. 
It was at this time that the figure of Azra Ret, chief librarian of the Mantis Warriors and known to his chapter as the Das Prophet, rose to prominence, effectively becoming master of the Mantis Warriors until the end of the war. Guided by the uncanny foresight and cunning leadership of Ret, the Mantis Warriors became an ever greater force to be reckoned with, determined and ruthless in defense of their honor and the worlds they were sworn to protect. Although the Mantis Warriors were considerably weakened from the war and ongoing attrition of it, their remaining strength was such that Karab Kul recognized the folly of leaving them undefeated at his flank, as the loyalists turned their full force to the invasion of the Badab sector. Particularly as on this other flank, the Executioner's chapter also remained a significant threat. Karab Kuln had already been considering a change in his deployments in order to mount a renewed offensive against the Endymion cluster, but with the arrival of the Karcharodons, Kuln was offered an unexpected asset to deploy, and he let loose their savage tide against the Mantis warriors and the worlds of their domain. They are no lamenters, but I still feel sorry for the Mantis Warriors. At best they are misguided in this conflict, at worst they are actively manipulated into fighting against the Imperium, with the theory that Euron was the one to want their chapter master dead and all. At least they didn't soil themselves with Eres or heavy dishonors, but I put the fault also on the Firehawks. If they didn't invade the Maelstrom Zone territory, this conflict would have never started in the first place. There is multifaceted reasons to hate the Firehawks, I started to think the Maris Marevor entirely that bad after all. The Cigar System was the first to taste the wrath and fury of the grey-clad Space Marines, and the Karcharodon fleet broke out of the warp directly above the system on the galactic plane, dangerously close to Cigar's swollen and violent sun. Using its solar flares as a shield, the fleet split up its dozens of striking forces and devastated the numerous belt colonies, ship clans and asteroid citadels of the Cigar System, destroying in mere days and weeks what had taken millennia to build, and had withstood the ravages of alien and renegade alike. An Imperial Navy scout vessel, the resplendent Martyr, with swept cigar in the aftermath of the attack, reported the entire system littered with wreckage and discordant with the ghostly vox signals of dead and dying ships. It also noted that along with the wholesale destruction, much had been deliberately plundered and scavenged, both in terms of gear, resources and indeed human life. It has been the conclusion of several authorities since that the choice of Sigard, with his wealth of void colonies and infrastructure, had been the Karcharodon's first target not simply because it had long connections with the Mantis warriors, but because after the Karcharodon's unknown voyage from the Outer Darkness, they had need of his bounty to replenish themselves in readiness for their part in the war. The verdant world of Iblis was to be the Karcharodon's next target. Already the giant feudal world had been the site of a great battle between the Firehawks and the encircling secessionist forces in the early stages of the war, leaving much of its equatorial veldt a scorched wasteland. Iblis had repeatedly sided with the Mantis warriors in the secession, and its petty kings still offered the chapter aid and support, despite having suffered punitive raids. The Karcharodons descended on the feudal world and systematically smashed its infrastructure and put its rulers to the sword attacking the planet's scattered settlements and nomadic crawler caravans by night, and leaving nothing but bloody wreckages. The Mantis warriors were swift to respond to the assault, attempting to distract and divert the Karcharodons with raids of their own against loyalist targets, and split up the attacking fleets by feigned flights and ruses, but to no avail. The Karcharodons would not be swayed, and after they had smashed Iblis into a disjoint wasteland inhabited only by scattered bands of shell-shocked survivors, the fleet moved on. This time their target was the blighted industrial world of Endymion Prime itself, where a small Fire Angels force were already holding command of its decrepit, fog-shrouded Manufactura complexes against Mantis warriors led insurgents. Without recourse to the Fire Angels' dispositions, the Karchardons assaulted from the skies into the contested sprawl, hundreds of drop pods hammering down into the soot-caked shanties amid a great slaughter. Endymion was quickly overtaken by a confused planet-wide battle which shattered the insurgency and set great waves of industrial sprawls ablaze, flooding other areas with millions of liters of poisonous chemical waste from sundered containment vessels. The honorable Mantis warriors could not abandon the world to its fate and had no choice but to respond, coming to Endymion's aid with increasing numbers of their chapter's battle brothers, in an attempt to curb the savagery of the Karcharodon's assault. The Mantis warriors matched the Karcharodon's callous slaughter with their own fierce martial skill in hit and run attacks and murderous ambushes, but they were too few and could not turn the tide of the assault. They would not retreat, however, even after Hazra Red forbade further attempts at reinforcement, but the marines already deployed fought and died in defense of their ancient pact with the people of Endymion, 
Just as the plan that Legat Frain had concocted with the Carcharodon's chapter master Tiberos had predicted they would. The patterns were repeated on the minor worlds of Xtal and Largitor, and then the twin worlds of the Tranquility System themselves. Here attacks smashed each world's infrastructure, one after the other, leaving desperate survivors alive to suffer on in the wake of their punishment. Again and again the Mantis warriors were brought to battle, and although they saw some victories against the Onslaught and inflicted casualties of their own, each time fewer of them returned to fight again. By the end of 910 and 41, the Strike and Cluster's resistance was crushed, and the Mantis warriors, now worn down and scattered, had ceased to exist as an effective fighting force, but at a great price. Starvation, disease, and lingering death were now the only masters of a dozen inhabited worlds, and millions were left unburied to rot beneath the sightless stars. In the aftermath of the Tranquility Campaign, the Fire Angel Space Marines, having in prior battles earned for themselves the highest honor in the Badab War and suffered heavy casualties, sought permission to withdraw from the conflict. This unusual act was in no small part owing to the increasing anger of the Fire Angels chapter against the Carcharodons, with whom they had repeatedly been at odds during the Tranquility Campaign, and whose methods they held in utter contempt. Rather than risk the growing enmity between the two Loyalist chapters sparking into full-scale civil conflict, and with some minor skirmishes already fought between the chapters, the Fire Angels departed with honor to their homeworld to rebuild their sorely damaged chapter. Imagine being so brutal and ruthless in a war that even other Space Marine chapters, created to fight the worst wars of the Imperium, get fed up by how much collateral damage and unnecessary death you cause, and decide that they either have to leave or kick your ass. Space Marines still cling to honor and chivalry, Pio, like the Knights of old. They aren't mindless killing machines. That is why the Fire Angels were disgusted by the Carcharodons. And I fought to shun of the salamanders, punching a Marine's malevolent captain in the face with enough strength to knock him out over the bombing of civilians was the peak of Space Marine disgust. Yeah, we are not doing a segment to explain those events now. Not because we can't, but because I am lazy, and this video is on the Badab War. With the Endymion Cluster no longer a threat to the Loyalist flanks, the Carcharodons redeployed, splitting their fleets to patrol the Loyalist rear echelons and relieve the Minotaurs and Red Scorpions, to consolidate ahead of the expected invasion of the Badab Sector. But this wouldn't be the last time the Carcharodons would fight in the Endymion Cluster. 260, 911, M41. An increase in Corsair activity along the eastern Maelstrom zone in mid 910 and 41 led the Loyalists to believe that at least one Astral Close task force had slipped out of the Badab sector, and was now operating from the edges of the Maelstrom itself. Concerned that this could be the start of a new battlefront opening on their flank, Imperial Navy escorts search and destroy squadrons were dispatched to the area to hunt for evidence of enemy operations and quell the attacks. Traversing even the edge of the Maelstrom was a dangerous business, and the squadron suffered high rates of crew casualties to madness and storms, even without making contact with the enemy. On the frontier world of Rook, one of the few worlds in the Maelstrom whose puritanical population of oblationist zealots could be relied upon to willingly aid Imperial agents, they found their evidence. Here they heard testimony of increasing slave raids of nearby systems, and attacks by human corsair ships led by an astral close strike cruiser they identified as the Ercania. This pattern of attacks was tracked by the squadron's lead navigator, the infamous and legendarily skilled Donna Nostromo, by their echo in the warp to their even star system of Lamptan, and his twin feral worlds of Shaprias and Scarfell. Thus, having divined that a strong enemy force was amassing at Lamptan, the Imperial Squadron, now badly in need to refit and resupply, returned to seek reinforcements. Elsewhere in the war, the Loyalists and Secessionists had once more entered into a period of increasing armed engagement. In the Northern Maelstrom Zone, the Carcharodons were enacting the final stages of the Tranquility Campaign, while in the Southern Zone, the Minotaurs and Sons of Medusa, backed by Imperial Guard Pinar regiments, were assaulting Isin on the edge of the Badab sector itself, where a tenacious defense was underway by the Tyrant's Legion. During this period, Lord Commander Kuhn was then marshalling his own Red Scorpions and the newly reinforced Exorcist chapter contingents at Sagan, in preparation for an assault on the strategic warp Terminus of Piraneus, a target considered by many to be the gateway to the Badab sector. Overall, the Loyalist Marines' forces were stretched thin in the war, despite the reinforcements of the Carcharodons, but it was then that the old warrior Pellas Mirsan, leader of the Salamander Space Marine contingent deployed in the war, during a council with Karab Kuln and the other commanders of the forces deployed, would offer a solution to the events of Lamptan. 
He offered to lead his own forces, now a little under accompanying strength, but very well equipped in armor and weapons, in a lightning strike against Lampton, relying on the element of surprise, the arcane skills of Onna Nostromo to position their attack, and the power of their potent battle barge, the Pyre of Glory, to deal a crippling blow to the enemy. Kuln was aware of the risks as well as the potential rewards of this plan, and was further moved in its favor when somewhat unexpectedly, the grim and taciturn chaplain Ivanus and Komi, who represented the often aloof and secretive Minotaur chapter in the War Council, offered to take his own personal guard and such forces he could master in aid of the mission. So approved, Mirsan's strike force, named the Gift of Fire, was further augmented by a pair of Imperial Navy light cruisers and a frigate squadron. This force was dispatched immediately from Sagan on the long voyage to the murderous and turbulent vortex of the Maelstrom itself and the Lamptan system, ready to meet the foe in battle. But nobody, loyalist or traitor, could foresee the catastrophic events that would unfold there and that would change drastically the course of the war. Entering real space in the inner sphere of the erratic binary star system of Lamptan, with its serpent-like plume of burning gas coiling between the two suns, the loyalist fears were soon realized. Clearly visible above the feral world of Shapria as there was a ragged armada of star vessels, scows and wrecks had been assembled from scavenged orcs and pirated freighters, while auspex scans and agory probes revealed that on the planet below, vast camps and training grounds had been raised up, beneath the shadow of iron-sided bastion towers, and ringed with kilometers of blade wire. Here on Shaprias, a new army was being forged from brutal and tainted tribal warriors, enslaved to the tyrant's cause, and was in the process of being tempered into a spear to be hurled at the loyalists from an unexpected quarter, at disposable weapons to kill and be killed at Lufty Euron's will. Given the presence of only a few Corsair escorts and raider ships in near orbit, which were quickly scattered by the attack, Mirsan deducted that the bulk of the enemy warships were away on some mission of plunder, and there would be no better time to strike. His swiftly configured attack plan was a bold and resolute one. The Salamanders and Minotaurs will make immediate planetfall to attack the secessionist bastions and training camps, while after conducting the orbital insertion, their ships will sweep immediately out again and set about destroying the armada of would-be troop ships as swiftly and thoroughly as possible, thus removing both factors of the threat. The drop pods and thunderhawks of the two chapters rode down through Shapria's cold crimson skies, accompanied by bombardments from the Pyre of Glory's macro cannons against what was deemed to be the most heavily entrenched targets. Once in the atmosphere, the two chapters divided to their chosen killing grounds. The Minotaurs attacked the Iron Shot Bastions where the Dark Architects of this domain were likely concealed, while the bulk of the Salamander's forces descended on the art of the city-sized training camps. A secondary force, composed of a chosen wing of Kaestus pattern assault rams, carrying aboard them a force of Salamander's Fire Drake Terminators, the greatest warriors of their esteemed chapter, took on the task of attacking the secessionist landing grounds. On their first pass, the armored prows and magna meltas of the Caestus savaged the enemy transport crafts caught on the ground and burned through their holes, rapturing their fuel tanks. The flames soared hundreds of meters into the air in incandescent storms, phosphor white against the red skies. The fire drakes, assaulting from their craft into the billowing black poles of smoke, turned confusion and destruction into a massacre, their storm bolters and cyclone missile launchers sweeping the panicked foe away before any resistance could be organized. Elsewhere, the main Salamander's force, led by Captain Mirsan, had descended into the heart of the enemy, deploying their troops and armor into a defensive ring at the center of the training camps. Utterly surrounded, the Salamander's force at less than a hundred space marines was outnumbered more than a thousand to one by the horde of savages and mutants, the brutal inhabitants of a dozen nearby worlds that rose up before them. For any other warriors, the position would have been a suicidal one, but these were the scions of Vulcan, and they cared little for such odds. Staggered by the sudden fury and shock of the assault, the Great Horde, all but leaderless and without thought, was slow to react, and by the time they pressed the attack, the savage mass was met by a wall of firepower, and thousands fell within the opening minutes of the battle, as whirlwind launchers, destructor pattern predator tanks, and the ordered ranks of the salamanders let fire at almost point-blank range into a solid mass of flesh and bone. Hundreds were killed in the opening volleys, and the enemy staggered immediately. 
Their jagged blades and autoguns a poor answer to the output of the armories of Prometheus. What few heavier weapons the enemy brought to bear were quickly marked and destroyed by concentrated fire. As the broken ground of the training fields was steadily covered with mounds of twitching bodies, the horde, shying away from the bloodshed, only rallied when their taskmasters took to the fields behind them. The bloodstained and still colored the power armor of Astral Claw's retaliator squads, amid the dirty cloth and pale skins of the Horde clearly visible to the heightened senses of the Salamanders, as they kept up their relentless tide of fire. You could say the Salamanders during this battle were fired up. Okay, that's it. This was the last bad joke. You are going to the Monkula, now, Pio. No, no, no. As the Salamanders marked their true foe amid the carnage, Mirsan sprang the second phase of his assault plan into action, and three land raiders of the rare and prized Achilles pattern spearheaded a counter-assault aimed directly at the Astral Close contingent. The tank's thunderfire cannon blasted holes through the ranks of the Horde, and their multi-melta slashed into the packed masses of bodies turning scores of savage fighters into screaming explosions of blood and steam with each blast. The Land Raiders' thrice-blessed holes shrugged off the last cannon beams and shrieking missiles the Astral Close sought to stop them with, and opened a coarse spade path clear through to the center of the Astral Close force. This achieved, the inviolate tree of Land Raiders swung aside as the fury of the Ancients was unleashed. Six Drenouts, led by Briya Tashmantle, known darkly in the chronicles of his chapter as the Iron Dragon, stormed into the waiting Astral Close like a thunderbolt, smashing them asunder and drenching them with purifying flame. Overmatched and overwhelmed, the Astral Claws did not yield lightly, but were slain in glorious combat, felling two of the Salamander's ancients. As the Astral Claws died, the name of the tyrant was howled with their centurion's dying breath as the Iron Dragon tore him in half and cast his carcass to the winds. With their master slaughtered, the Horde panicked and fell back, the tens of thousands that remained alive fleeing in a mindless stampede away from the Lords of Fire and Death at their backs, crushing and killing hundreds more of their own number in the panic. At the Bastion Line, the Minotaurs met with firmer resistance. The defenses had been built into a range of basalt crags with the Astral Claws' typical diligence and skill, and the Iron Shot Towers were studded with heavy bolter and battle cannon emplacements that covered every ground approach with interlocking kill zones, while Quad Guns and Icarus Last Cannons guarded the skies above them. The Minotaur's assault began with low-level attack runs by Thunderhawk gunships, which skimmed the jagged terrain to focus their firepower on a carefully selected point in the Bastion line. Punching a gap in the firing lines and disgorging assault terminators and devastator squads directly into the smoking wreckage. Braving the storm of fire, the rest of the company's strong Minotaur's force deployed directly behind this breakpoint, which suffered the brunt of the enemy counterattack. The Minotaur's vanguard held the ruined bastion with disciplined ferocity, not giving an inch of ground to the oncoming secessionist forces despite the heavy casualties. The bronze-armored Minotaurs clashed in brutal close combat with the Astral Close retaliators who advanced under cover of their combat shields through a hail of bolter fire, to try and retake the Sunder fortifications, only to be hurled back time and time again from the mount of twisted metal and shattered rock crit. Although in number the attacking Minotaurs and the defending Astral Claws at the Bastion line were roughly equal, the Astral Claws were well dug in, well armed and led, and lacked nothing for bravery and fighting spirit. The Minotaurs, however, were masters of siegecraft, and this blood-soaked close quarter hell was exactly the kind of battlefield in which they reveled. With the Astral Claws counter-attack pinned in place at the Shattered Bastion, the formed-up Minotaur's second attack line, led by an armored spearhead of Land Raiders and Siege Drenouts, opened up a parallel assault against the next Bastion in the chain. Chaplin and Comey personally commanded the jump pack equipped Vanguard veterans in storming the second enemy Bastion, and slaying all within, his Vox amplified battle cries echoing louder even than the roar of the guns. Cut off and encircled, the Astral Close Sunlight Force was swiftly isolated and destroyed in detail, as the Minotaurs began advancing one half of their forces to take the next bastion in line, while the other consolidated the previous prize and rearmed in preparation for the next sequential assault. 
The progress was slow and bloody, and the astral clause made them pay a price in debt for every fortification the Minotaurs took, but the secessionist martial fury could not stem the loyalist advance and one by one, the bastions fell and victory was claimed by the Minotaurs. Deep beneath the smashed fortifications, the Minotaurs and Salamanders soon discovered what secret they were built to defend, a vast natural cover system housing heretic laboratories. These had been manufacturing combat drugs in vast quantities, and attempting primitive gene tempering and experimental surgery on the feral warriors of Shaprias, along with hundreds of imperial prisoners taken in raids across the eastern maelstrom zone. At the lowest levels, guarded by a group of hated Corsaker apothecaries of the Tyrant's Legion and their servitors, was an armored vault within which was a store of Space Marines Ginseed, which was in part stolen from loyalists fallen in battle. What? They were stealing the Ginseed of the fallen Marines they themselves killed in battle? Yes, Pio. This shows you the moral corruption of the Astral Clause themselves by this point. It isn't just Euron that went mad. With him, the entire chapter lost their honor and decided to move away from the Emperor's light, and betray anything Anastarty stands for. The Astral Clause are not his angels anymore, they are just traitors in different colors. While the battle had raged below, the conflict in orbit had also gone in the Loyalist's favor, but not without cost. While the makeshift armada had been blasted to scrap and burning debris, concealed weapon platforms set to guard the fleet had inflicted damage to the Pyre of Glory and gutted the sword-class frigate Epona, which had to be abandoned as a burning hulk. Less than 11 standard days after the battle was first joined, Gift of Fire departed the Lamptan system to undertake the perilous voyage back to the Loyalist Hell space, with over a thousand freed prisoners carried in the holes of his naval light cruisers, and the priceless Ginseed held in the inner sanctum of the Pyre of Glory itself. Gift of Fire had claimed a great victory for the Loyalists, and uncovered and thwarted a dark machination of the tyrants that, if left unchecked, could have had dire consequences for the Imperium. The High Command, however, could have not predicted what happened next. 270-911-M41 The Gift of Fire Task Force, fresh from its victory in the Lamptan system, was unexpectedly struck by a powerful warp squall and scattered en route back to the Imperial control space. Utter calamity was averted by the skills of their lead navigator Nostromo, and only a single frigate was lost to the warp, while the Salamander's battle barge, the Pyre of Glory, and the light cruiser Admiral Gregorius were turned back into the maelstrom riding ahead of the storm front, and forced to return into real space in the relative stability of the Kala Shoals within the maelstrom boundary. With their Geller fields on the point of collapse and their drives failing, the two Loyalist vessels limped into the outer orbit of Kala's boundaries to repair and refit. Their arrival at Kala had not gone unnoticed, however, and a human raider ship that had been training with the scattered orc lairs that infested the inner system departed unseen and carried news of their presence to the secessionists. The Astral Close strike cruiser Irkania was still in the region, having found its home base on Shaprias destroyed, and its master, the Astral Close Arch Centurion Kornak Commodus, craved vengeance and a chance to right his failings in his lord's eyes. Alone, however, Commodus' single strike cruiser had little chance of taking on the wounded loyalist with success, and he so desperately sought assistance in taking on the enemy while they were still isolated. His encrypted astropathic message found an unexpected ally in the fight on Svrat, flagship battle barge of the Executioner's Chapter, which had been taking in supplies at the uninhabited ocean world of Deluge, on the edge of the Magog Cluster. The combined battle group attacked as the Loyalist vessels moved toward the warp transfer point at Kala to embark again on their troubled voyage, their repairs at last completed. The battle was swift and hard fought, with the Admiral Gregorius blasted two atoms in the opening salvo of the secessionist guns, although the Pair of Glory quickly proved to be far less easy prey. Repelling the first two boarding assaults against her and destroying two of the attacking frigates, heavy fire from Phyton's Vrat managed to entirely disable the Salamander's battle barge thrusters after a three-hour long run in battle, leaving it dead in space. With the Pyre of Glory disabled, Tulsa Kane, master of the executioners, Vox signaled the Salamander's vessel and offered them a chance of honorable surrender, offering safe passage for them from the war zone under oath to not take up arms again in the conflict. Pellar Smith's son, commanding the Salamander's force, conceded to this demand, despite the misgivings of some of those under his command, knowing that otherwise his force would be destroyed without any ability to strike back at their foe. Pellar Smir's son was a wise and highly experienced veteran commander, and knew that the vainglorious sacrifice of his force would achieve nothing other than to benefit the Imperium's enemies. Having himself fought alongside the Executioner's chapter centuries before as a scout neophyte, he trusted to the road of offered safety. 
Both the Phytons Wrath and the Arcania drew alongside the battered pyre of glory and docked, Tulsa Kane personally leading the executioner's boarding party and accepting Mirsan's sword in surrender as the salamanders stood down their arms. It was elsewhere within the great ship that the unthinkable occurred. Arch Centurion Commodus had led his own boarding party to seize the Pyre of Glory armories, and thanks to the conditions of the surrender, had been all but unopposed. Heedless of the consequences, Commodus sought to breach the ship's sanctum vaults in search of the prize in Ginseid he hoped to find there. Not only that which the salamanders had recovered from the caverns of Shaprias, but the sons of Noctun's own recovered stock from the fatalities they had sustained during the war. When the salamander's apothecaries resisted, the snarling Commodus cut them down. The Arch Centurion's vengeful fury unleashed, immediately he ordered the massacre of the salamanders they had taken prisoner, commanding his corpse takers to strip them of their ginseed whether alive or dead, and pitched battle broke out across all decks. As reports of what was happening reached the bridge chamber, Tulsa Kane was incensed to a murderous rage. Mirsan, seeing this, wisely understood that the executioners may not have full knowledge of the enormities of heresy and blasphemy the Astral Claws had come to embrace, perhaps having been deliberately deceived by the tyrant. Controlling his own outrage, Mirsan poured deliberate scorn on the executioner's leader, both for this breach of his word and the dishonor of standing by and allowing the tyrant's sin to go unchallenged. With the report of his executioner's own eyes giving the gravity of truth to Mirsan's claims, Kane's wrath was terrible to behold. And it was at this moment that the Astral Claws would learn a grave lesson. A lesson that would hunt loyalists and traitors alike for the centuries to come. In that moment, they learned that they can soil their own honor how much they want, that they can brutalize their perceived enemies with all the wrath they can master, but that there is no worse sin to commit in a war than trying to soil the honor of your own allies, especially if those allies are Astartes, or worse, sons of Rogal Dorn. Immediately, Tulsa Kane declared the blood oath binding his chapter to Euron's cause had been violated and broken, and the dark stain of infamy the astral clause had brought upon them could only be washed clean with a river of blood. Brothers executioners, the astral clause have betrayed the Imperium, their honor, and our blood oath. We will not stand witness to loyal Astartes being cut down at the hands of traitors and do nothing in the name of Rogal Dawn. Kill them! Oh! Those Salamander's Battle Brothers that survived what was to come have since given witness that a bleak madness came upon the executioners at Kane's pronouncement, and that they tore into the astral clause with murderous vengeance, heedless of the risk of their own lives, satisfied only that their former allies would die by their hands, regardless of the cost. Pellas Mirsan rallied those salamanders that yet survived and mounted a defense of the battle barge in her sanctum, unleashing the power of Breyat, a Drenout, and his fellow ancients to aid them. The corridor and vaults of first the immense and ancient Pyre of Glory, and then the astral claws Irkania ran red with blood. In what quickly entered the legends of the war as the Red Hour, every single astral claw, chapter serf and servitor present was relentlessly and savagely slaughtered, and the Irkania was left a charnel house of decapitated bodies. As a deathly silence fell in the aftermath, Tulsa Kane came alone before Mirsan at the gates of the Sanctum, his grim armor scorched and torn. He knelt in the light of the burning Sanctum braziers before the salamanders, and offered them no words. But from beneath his rugged black cloak, he left a single gory object fall and roll at Mirsan's feet. It was the head of Arch Centurion Commodus. The executioners withdrew without further comment, leaving the stricken pyre of glory and the empty strike cruiser docked alongside and departed. But their madden and desire for vengeance had not been satisfied, and soon its message reached every corner of the Maelstrom Zone. From this point onward, the executioner's chapter became a rogue element in the war. Not only seeking out and ascending with madness imbued fury on the astral claws and their agents wherever they could be found, outside of the safety of Badab itself, but also refusing to surrender to loyalist forces when encountered. The most notorious incident of this kind was the executioner's destruction of the Sons of Medusa strike cruiser Warspite in the Griff system when battle groups from both forces engaged unexpectedly off the warp route transfer point there, but there were numerous others. Beyond this, however, the Executioner's chapter attacks on wider Imperial shipping ceased almost immediately. This development was explained only when some standard month later, the near-wrecked Pyre of Glory finally put into port at the Loyalist battle station at Sorngrad, with a strange and bloody tale to tell. For the Terran's cause, there could have been no more bitter blow than to have allies turn enemies. 
not only had the severing of the executioners from the secessionist cause robbed the Euron forces of much of its remaining strength in warships and raider crafts, but as foes, the executioners were both implacable and had the advantage of detailed knowledge of many of the secession's hidden bases and deployments, which they put to immediate use in destroying them. With first the Lamenters and then the Mantis warriors shorn from the secessionist order of battle, and now most bitterly the executioners turned against them, Luft Euron and what remained of his once mighty astral claws were truly alone before the Imperium's wrath, their dreams of dominion and eternal glory all but shattered. 310, 911, and 41. Following what was regarded as the treachery of his former allies, Luft Euron announced in a recorded message that was relayed throughout the Badab sector that the Astral Claws and their subjects were no longer part of the Imperium of Men, an institution he saw as a bankrupt rotting carcass, fit only for the grave. But Badab itself was now a state dedicated to survival and the triumph of mankind. The Tyrant Furter's war that he and his followers would fight to their last breath to avenge themselves upon those who had betrayed us and maintain their freedom, ending the soon infamous recording with the statement that the strong are strongest alone. Okay, I'm starting to see more Euron Blackheart by this point than the original Euron. Have you not read the title of the video, Pio? The changes started long before the end of the war. Soon afterwards, within Euron's remaining domains, all signs and symbols of imperial authority, culture and creed were cast down in a firestorm of iconoclasm, and the mass executions on Badab primaries of clerics and functionaries, most of whom had remained largely ignorant of the true cause and nature of the war, were reported to last for many weeks without pause. Up until this point, it is to be remembered that although the Badab secessionists had been declared heretic by the Imperium, within the worlds they had controlled, the pattern of established life had gone on much as it had for many centuries, and the worship of the God Emperor had been maintained. The influential people that had openly disagreed with the secession had been removed and replaced with those more loyal to Euron and his cause, and millions still followed their fate unimpeded, while the sector's native defenders believed naturally enough that they fought and died in battle against heresy, rather than in its name. No longer, however, was the truth concealed from the pitiable masses of the Badab sector, and in the tyrant's spite and fury, great basilicas were toppled, and clergy and adepts were slaughtered with complete disregard for their allegiance. As for the astral clothes themselves, although the practice was by no means universal, many of the battle brothers began to deface any semblance of imperial heraldry and insignia from their armor and war gear, scouring it to bare metal and doubling it in reds and crimson in representation of their blood oath of vengeance, until only the symbols of the tyrant remained. Inquisitorial agents infiltrating the Badab sector at this time report that conditions on its principal worlds grew even harsher. Famines were commonplace, and a shadow of despair had fallen over everything. Under Euron, the population of the Badab sector had been controlled with inflexible and savage discipline, but were still viewed as a war resource to be maintained and managed. Now the Astral Close Wrath grew even more arbitrary and brutal as their increasing paranoia, and the murderous rages to which Luft Euron was becoming prone took their toll on those unfortunates caught within the Tyrant's domains. On Badab Primaris, for non Astartes to dare look directly upon the face of one of the Astral Claws was now punishable by blinding. And after an assassin tried to take the life of Euron within his own command chamber and was slain by the Tyrant himself, non Space Marines were banned entirely from the precinct of the Palace of Thorns, under punishment of death. And thousands of civilians were killed in groundless reprisals by the Astral Claws retaliators. As to the mindset of the Astral Claws themselves, most, it seemed, had succumbed to a siege mentality. They expected death as now inevitable, but were spurred on by a bleak desire for vengeance against those they believed had wronged them, spite and rage consuming what little remained of their honor. 705, 911, and 41. Having waited as long as he thought strategically advantageous to gather forces for heavy assault, Lord Commander Kuhn put into action his plans for the invasion and conquest of the Piraeus system, on the edge of the Badab sector. The assault on Badab itself was about to start. Loyalist Strategic Command had identified the Piraeus system as the key to the subsequent attack on the central Badab system itself, thanks to the relatively stable war route between the two regions. Piraeus would be an ideal staging post for an invasion, as it already possessed extensive lunar orbital station and minor shipyards centered around the gas giant Crisias. These facilities, if conquered intact, would both weaken the secessionists further and be of invaluable assistance to the Loyalists as a forward base. 
a plan long in the fruition, Kulna had already set up a series of secondary fronts at Isin and the Cabalus, where raids and hit and run actions by his own Red Scorpion chapter, along with the Minotaurs and Exorcist, had destabilized much of the region, and forced the Tyrant's armies to spread their outer defenses thinly. The initial attack plan against Piraeus called for a heavy assault to interdict the industrial world of Piraeus V, also known as Yarrow Station, with a direct space marine assault against the lunar colonies on the second moon of the Piraeus dominant gas giant, Critias. This attack was to be conducted by the combined forces of the Exorcist and the Red Scorpions chapter, their strike force amounting to an effective strength of six Space Marine companies. The majority of the Space Marine contingent was made up of fresh reinforcements of the Exorcist chapter, who Lord Commander Kuhn had kept in reserve for this closing stage of the war, although overall tactical command of the assault was taken up by Lord Commander Kuhn himself. From the start, the invasion of the Piraeus system was subject to reversal and unexpected calamity. This first reared its head when one of the Imperial Navy cruisers attached to the task force, the Spear of Mezzoa, suffered a catastrophic Geller field failure as the invasion fleet left the Larsa system to make the warp transit to Piraeus, hurling all on board screaming to their doom in the Imperian. Further unexpected turbulence in the usually stable warp route further disrupted the ill-fated fleet damaging and scattering several ships and forcing the remainder to struggle to arrive into real space at the target system's edge, further out than had been planned, and scattered over a period of many hours thanks to time distortion effects of the warp. Far from their chosen attack vector to the system, the Loyalist ships were forced to reassemble and operate at maximum thruster burn for a number of days to reach the inner worlds of Piraeus, after which time all element of surprise had been lost. With little choice but to press the attack, the Loyalist fleet reassembled itself and made best speed to engage. This fleet included some two battle barges and four strike cruisers, alongside a single battleship and six cruisers of the Imperial Navy, several squadrons of minesweepers, an escort as well as flotillas of planetary assault crafts, ferrying Imperial Guard and Inquisitorial forces. The initial enemy resistance in space, as expected, proved insufficient to slow the attacking column down. Sporadically encountered minefields were breached or bypassed without loss, and long-range auguries detected only a dozen defense monitor ships and a score of locally produced destroyers, inferior copies of the Imperial Pujus-class ships. This defense armada would have been enough to stand off a sizable raiding force, particularly in combination with the chain of orbital weapons platforms which formed a second line around Piro's fifth. But against the force Lord Commander Kuhn had assembled, they stood little chance of long delaying, let alone preventing, the Loyalist assault. How did we get here from a war started because somebody didn't pay taxes? I had told you at the beginning, Pio, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Like Magnus when he pierced the Webway project to warn the Emperor of Horus' betrayal, welcome to the hell Euron created for himself, with his pride and ego. Welcome to the brutal closing stages of the Badab War. Despite the Loyalists were forced to endure for several hours long-range torpedo bombardments against their ships, they reached their mission breakpoint intact and split to engage their separate targets without incident. The bulk of the Imperial naval ships, led by the Retribution-class battleship Throne of Blood, broke off to engage the defense fleet and bombard Piraeus V, while the Space Marines strike force diverted to assault the moon of Critias Secundus. The fighting above Piraeus V proved particularly fierce, as the defense ships flanked themselves almost suicidally against the attackers, scoring several hits against the oncoming cruisers before being wiped out. They fought as if the Tyrant's claw was at their necks, and they feared him far more than mere death at the muzzles of our guns, as the Vice Admiral Kagawa commanding the Throne of Blood would later comment. The Imperial Navy ships, however, were prevented from achieving their secondary objective of close bombardment of Piraeus V, as ground fire from the massive emplacements of macro cannon and defense laser batteries on the surface, unpredicted in strength and ferocity, forced the naval ships back. Their fury crippling the Terran class cruiser Gantlet of Ages when it strayed too close. Elsewhere, in orbit of Critias Secundus, despite strong resistance, greater success was found by the Loyalists, and between them, the combined might of the Red Scorpion's Ward of Ordon and the Exorcist Redeemer smashed aside the Moon's asteroid force in short order. Landing zones in the vicinity of the Lunar Colony's main citadels and Genetora stations were quickly identified and subjected to preliminary bombardment, before a full-scale planet strike was initiated via Thunderhawk and drop pod assaults. The Space Marine's task was to strike hard and with speed, to take the Lunar Colonies and their strategically valuable facilities intact. On landing, the Red Scorpions and Exorcist were immediately met head-on by the Tyrant's Legion in a strong counteroffensive. 
Their enemies numbers increase several fold by indentured workers, include breeder masks, to protect them from Critia's poisonous air, driven on by the use of explosive collars, and armed with little more than sharpened tools and crude Prometheum bombs. The Terran's Legion Auxilia and their slave worker allies were killed in droves by the assaulting space marines in hectic close quarter fighting, but their numbers alone slowed the attackers down and prevented them from finding out to their individual targets as planned. It was at this point, with the bulk of the Red Scorpions and Exorcists engaged but effectively bottled into their landing zones, that the Astral Close trap was sprung. Previously silent and long concealed ground batteries fired from the depths of the alien forest that covered the moon, striking down Thunderhawks and landing crafts and ripping into the Space Marines' ships in close orbit above, their vessels' bellies exposed as they descended to deploy their deadly cargo. The Sword of Ordon barely made it into space and escaped the brunt of the barrage, spewing flame and trailing debris from her shattered launch base. While the Exorcist strike cruiser Aleph Argentium, having moments before deployed its last forces, was caught in a crossfire of converging plasma streams and exploded, showering burning wreckage down onto the planet, setting ablaze hundreds of square kilometers of tangled vegetation below. From within the moon's citadels, cannons and mortars thundered afresh, pelting the loyalist space marines with missiles and shells, indiscriminately targeting the battles where their own forces were engaged at close quarters with the loyalists. This was only a heralding barrage, however, and from bunkers concealed beneath the tiered, disc-stacked towers, scores of land raiders and rhino transports bearing the insignia of the star-clutching Black Claw roared forth, the astral claws in near chapter strength, and with their master, Luft Euron at their head. Lord Commander Karab Kuln and those that stood with him were caught between the fire above and the tyrant below. The Tyrant, it seems, had long ago predicted the importance of the Piraeus system as a keystone in the Badab sector's defense, and drew his own plan accordingly. Likewise, through spies and auguries of his own, he had been able to anticipate the Loyalist's plan of attack. Whether his decision to lead the counter-attack personally was a stroke of brilliance or folly can be argued in either case, but for all his overwinning pride and black-hearted heresy, Luft Euron was certainly no coward, and he was still a brilliant commander in the field, whose presence, in and of itself, provided the secessionist force on Crisia Secundus with a great asset in battle. The presence of a concentration of astral claws on Crisias, and the secret upgrading and cunning deployment of his defenses had not been the whole of the Terran strategies either, and within an hour of the hidden guns on Crisias Secundus opening fire and cutting off the Loyalist spearhead from its supporting ships, the Terran's own war fleet ripped into real space at the edge of the inner Piraeus system. What was to follow was to be one of the largest and the last major fleet engagements of the Badab War. The secessionist armada represented the last excise of their once vaunted naval power, its flagship was the final remaining operable battle barge in the Astral Close fleet, the mighty and storied Seraph of Judgment, clustered around which were eight line-class vessels. These were the last remnants of the Secessionist Chapter and Maelstrom Squadron fleets, including two strike cruisers, the Relic Cardinal-class heavy cruiser Throat Sound and the Gothic-class cruiser Dreadchild, captured from the Cartan forces seven years before. Alongside the main force were over 60 other vessels, a ramshackle conglomeration of chapter escorts, patrol frigates, raider crafts of unknown provenance, and hastily converted armored transports. Suicide weapons packed with volatile cargo and primitive atomic explosives, and driven before the main fleet. I don't think there is such a thing as a primitive atomic bomb in a universe that still uses incenses and oils to turn on computers. Well, it is no cyclonic warhead, for sure. They should have tried to teleport those bombs on the ships of the Loyalists. If Taurovalia Cash can, they can for sure. Good one, Pio. Vice Admiral Kagawa, as saying the suddenly shifted tactical situation, realized that if the Terran's fleet could take on the two Loyalist forces, both of which had already sustained damage and expended considerable stock of their ordnance in separate engagements, they might attain a crushing victory. But if matched against both simultaneously, the Loyalists would be far more evenly matched against them. He immediately ordered his fleet to maximum velocity and moved away from the oncoming enemy ships, and via coded channels sent a request setting out his assessment of the upcoming battle to the Space Marine forces near Crisia Secundus. Attempting to demand their compliance he realized would be fruitless, and so he appealed to their greatest chance of victory. With communications with the ongoing ground war impossible, it was with heavy heart that Captain Wait Rider, the Exorcist Master of the Fleet, reluctantly agreed with the Vice Admiral's dire assessment of the situation, and complied with his plan of feigned retreat and rendezvous. The Space Marine's ships withdrew at full power, slingshotting themselves around the gas giant of Crisias using its gravitational mass to boost their velocity. With their enemies seemingly in full flight before 
them, the secessionist fleet ravaged into the inner system at full speed. Their ships differ in trust forces, and the general indiscipline of their captains soon rendered the formation rugged and drawn out, as the slower vessels fell behind, and faster raider ships ran ahead. These frontrunners started striking at targets of opportunity such as the ungainly loyalist rear echelons transports. These now, despite fleeing at their best speeds, became easy prey to the hunters, thousands of the embarked troops aboard dying without ever knowing the cause of their demise. The badly damaged loyalist gauntlet of ages, her captain realizing that her ships could not keep up with his comrades, turned instead to a glorious and fatal last charge into the teeth of the oncoming enemy, deliberately seeking out and engaging the secessionist fireships before they could break havoc on the loyalist main force. Weathering broadside after broadside, and engulfed twice by the city nuclear fire of immolating ships, the gauntlet of ages still staggered on into the fray, her fury men in batteries keeping up sporadic fire until the Seraph of Judgment closed in and crushed her valiant heart. Below, on Critias Secundus, savage fighting raged on as two forces of humanity's greatest warriors clashed without mercy. Now outnumbered by an enemy whose might was their match, it was the loyalists who were pushed back into the ever-narrowing defensive circles, amid the stacked habitation towers and tangled alien forests. With little clear line of sight between the combatants, mass bloody hand-to-hand -hand confrontations and indiscriminate fire at half seen foes were the way of the battle. The astral close came on in savage and bitter fury, heedless of their merely human foot soldiers caught between them and the object of their vengeance. The red scorpions met them with riotous hatred of their own, while the exorcists displayed their usual unnerving calm in the face of overwhelming force. As in a battle from ancient myth, these gods of destruction clashed, and at their fore were the two masters of war. Lord Commander Karab Kuln of the Red Scorpions stood as an unyielding rock amid the storm of battle on which the enemy broke. And at his side was Henry Lott, chief librarian of the chapter, his armor glimmering with baleful light as he rent the foe asunder with murderous blasts of psychic force. Luft Euron, tyrant of Badab and master of the Astral Close, struck at the Exorcist line like a thunderbolt, smashing aside space marines as if they were pieces on a gaming board. Burning and hackling his way through the Crimson Armored Exorcist with wild, almost insane, abandon, the tyrant's blood splattered personal guard poured into the breach behind him, forming a murderous wedge as the tyrant strove to reach his true and chosen enemy, Karab Kuln. Silas Alberek, captain and commander of the Exorcist forces, knew that if he were not stopped, the tyrant alone might turn the course of the battle, and so opposed him, leading a counter assaulting force of his chapter's elite and Okean guard to confront Luft Euron head on. Intercepting the Tyrant's force at the foot of the looming habitation stack the Red Scorpions were using to anchor their defense. There, rather than being matched against the Tyrant, Silas Alberek found himself in a duel with Ancient Clator, one of the most feared and infamous of the Astral Close Dreadnought Brethren, and suffered terrible wounds which crushed and crippled his Terminator armor before disabling the Dreadnought's motive systems with his Relic Mace fell in the great beast of Adamantine and Ceramite. As the battle raged on at the foot of the many-tiered tower stack in a whirlwind confusion of blood and metal, the two masters of war at last found each other, and Karab Kuln and Luft Euron meshed their skills in personal combat. This was no organized and formal duel as might be told of in Chronicle of Legends, but a savage free-for-all amid a mass combat, with a press of armored bodies about them, and the air riven with bolt shells and plasma blasts. The tyrant came on in fury, bellowing his hatred and cursing the Golden Throne bitterly, while Kuln fought in grim silence. Every ounce of his formidable skill needed to wield his relic blade to counter the frenzy of blows rain on him by the tyrant's ghostly claw. Only the ancient heirloom of his chapter, the Blade of the Scorpion, seemed proof against his enemy's blows, and within moments of Luft Euron's onslaught, Karab Kuln had seen his storm bolter shredded like paper, his iron halo flicker and fail, and his terminator armor gouged and slashed in a dozen places. The wounds caused by the eerie lightning claw the Tyrant used were flowing freely with blood in defiance of his Astartes augmented metabolism. Finally, parting from the exchange of blows, did Karab Kuln answer the Tyrant's taunts with accusations of his own, bellowing that Euron was a traitor and Cur, a cool and petty false king, no better than a pawn of chaos, who had brought to ruin all the astral claws that's shriven and bled for these ages past for corrupt vanity and pride. 
The Tyrant of Badab, Furter Madden and then howling inarticulately with rage, charged again at the Red Scorpion, who, expecting the frenzied attack, deftly turned aside, allowing the Tyrant's momentum to take his Terminator armored bulk past. Lashing out with the blade of the Scorpion, he slashed deeply into the Tyrant's side, parting his false armor in a welter of blood. Such a blow should have felled even the mightiest Space Marine, but it did not slay the Tyrant of Badab. Luftyuron wheeled around, his claws arching down, the ghostly blades punching effortlessly to Karab Kuln breastplate and spearing into his chest, piercing flesh and bone alike. With monumental effort of will, Karab Kuln fought through his agony and hurled himself backwards onto the bloody ground before the Tyrant could close his clawed fingers and rip out the Red Scorpion's heart. Snarling in pain, Kuln slid down a slope of rubble and armored bodies before the looming tyrant, whose bitter laughter echoed above him. Darily wounded, Kuln staggered once more to his feet as the battle thundered on, and a new sun burned in the heavens, raining destruction down on all below. In the cold darkness of the void above Crisias, battle was once again joined between the now concentrated warships of the Imperium and the claw marked renegades of Badab. The secessionists both outnumbered the Loyalists and outgunned them. But the Loyalists, even though many of their vessels were damaged, had the greater number of heavy warships in their line of battle, and were far the greater in quality of skilled and disciplined crew. The rebel fleet came on in a chaotic and ragged attack column, and this was to prove their undoing, as the combined Imperial Navy and Space Marine warships formed into tight formation and crossed laterally in an oblique pass at the enemy column, maximizing their broadside while the secessionists could not fully bring theirs to bear. In their chaotic counter-attack, several of the secessionist own outlaying escorts were caught in the line of fire from the cruisers at the center of the column and were destroyed. Both sides took heavy damage in this first close pass, but the secessionists had the worst of it, with the ill-fated Dreadchild spinning out of control from the renegade attack column, fires burning within her stem to stern. The courses of the two fleets carried them on sweeping away from each other, and so thrusters flaring, they both strained to come about, tightened into concentric turns, and came again to engage it on. Weapons blazing, neither side holding back and each fleet willing to meet victory or defeat in a single tumultuous clash of the line. The void between them was split by gouts of fire and bright lances of energy, as the two sides hurled all their spite at each other. Fighter crafts tumbling and dying as starships exploded around them, in storms of radiation and shrapnel. The strike cruiser Godslayer rammed the throat sound and broke her back, cleaving the relic ship in two, while land strikes beat deep into the sword of Ordon, disabling her main guns. The throne of blood, her steering shattered and spewing fire from scores of craters and wounds on her flanks, confronted the Seraph of Judgment on a collision course at point blank range. The venerable battle barge frantically maneuvered to bring her bombardment cannon to bear, but the throne of blood unleashed a full salvo of melta-headed torpedoes at the last possible moment. Their machine spirits all locked onto the pulsing reactors deep within the battle barge's hull. In an instant, all became flooded with impossibly bright, burning white light. Professor Pio Time, a bright white flame means the explosion seat exceeded the 1500 degrees Celsius, or the 2732 degrees Fahrenheit. And when at last it had faded, a war machine that had survived a thousand battles and millennia of war was nothing but a smoldering corona of ash and radiation fog days. And the throne of blood tumbled on, its vast armored proud replaced with a scorched and blacked stamp. The star battle was won for the loyalists with the death of the Seraph of Judgment, but at great cost. And there remained a great deal of bloody fighting to do as the surviving enemy ships were put to flight or captured in a series of brutal boarding assaults. Before this tangled conflict could be resolved, a single ship broke free, its engines blazing far past their maximum Adeptus Mechanicus proscribed capacity. It was the Redeemer, and it was heading directly for Crisias Secundus. Bargaining that the planetary defenses would be half-blinded by the battle above them, Captain Ryder gambled all on a dangerous plan to extract the forces stranded below. Of all the Loyalist warships, by a combination of good fortune and skill over master and crew, the Redeemer was among the least damaged, and its base had been filled with surviving Thunderhawks from across the fleet for the emergency operation. The vast battle barge sliced into Christia Secundus' thin atmosphere at perilous speed, thrusting its void shields and blast all to keep it from breaking up under the battering force of re-entry. As predicted, the ground batteries, which had previously proven deadly against close range and slow moving targets, could not now quickly respond, and panicked when faced with this comet from the heavens. The fire blazing around their shields, making the Redeemer appear as a terrible blazing sun in the sky. 
Although all communications to the surface had been jammed, Librarian Talot of the Exorcist had locked in on the bright soul of Severin Lot and the familiar spark of his wounded master Alberic. And so, the Redeemer made for its target. As it rode appallingly low in the skies, its armored belly shining off the tops of tower stacks as it passed, a pressure wave ran before it like a tsunami and smashed the alien forest flat, toppling building and armored space marine alike before its fury. At this unexpected arrival, the astral claws were hurled back amid a storm of dust and debris. And below his sky blotting bulk, the battlefield where Kuln and the tyrant fought was showered in rubble and flame, parting them before their combat could reach a final conclusion in either's favor. Immediately, extraction operations got underway before the enemy could rally to the defense, as the Redeemer's guns, designed for the epic battles of fleet combat, spoke like the voice of an apocalypse, rending the ground asunder and pulverizing the towers of nearby citadels. In a fraught operation lasting nearly two hours, almost three in five of the loyal space marines that had made Planetfall were recovered, although most of them were either casualties or bore some fresh wound or scar to mark the furious combat they had seen. Not least of the wounded was Lord Commander Kuln, who was taken up in the care of his chapter apothecaries. The Redeemer, his tortured hull and overtaxed engines protesting under the strain, seals and bulkheads rupturing up and down a superstructure, made exit from the moon's atmosphere, ground fire tracing vengeful streaks behind her, void shields holding just long enough for the mighty ship to break orbit. The invasion of Piraeus was over, both sides claimed a victory and both sides tasted defeat. For the secessionists, the loyalist invaders had been driven off, and not one yota of ground had been surrendered to them. But in doing so, they had gambled the last of their once mighty fleet and lost it. And with it, any hope of maintaining dominion outside of the Badab system itself. Fatalities on both sides had been appallingly high, and Lord Commander Kuhn had seen his attacking force blunted and many of his most powerful ships of the line damaged to the extent that might take years to repair. For a brief time, some hoped that the tyrant himself had been slain in the anarchy of the extraction, but Kuhn did not believe it, and he was quickly proved right. The Badab War had arguably been won at Piraeus by the Loyalists, but there was one last battle to fight, and that was likely to be the most terrible of all, the final siege of Badab. The whole system was a heavily fortified death trap, the likes of which few had ever encountered, but the tyrant could not be left alone in his place of power to fester. If the invasion of Piraeus had a lesson to be learned, it was that the tyrant should never be underestimated, and nothing was more dangerous than a cornered beast. Wow, you don't really lost it. He was fighting more like a corn berserker than anything. Ambition was his own ruination, he mirrors Horus in many ways. He was leading one of the mightiest alliances of forces of humanity. But the moment he didn't get what he wanted, he started breaking rule after rule that was in place to avoid exactly situations like Badab. By this point, he's more Euron Blackheart than Luft Euron. Just a few events are missing to complete the transformation, and I hope you are ready for them, Pio. What do you mean? After more than two months of wait, after two videos that already total more than two and a half hours of lore content, we are entering the end of the war. Now only Badab stands. So, even if this is not the end, because remember, there is a part four that will conclude the series, after hundreds of hours of research and work, we are at the end of the biggest civil war after the Horus Heresy. Can I get a pizza to the basement to celebrate the end of the war then? No. Damn it. 519, 912, and 41. After the catastrophic events surrounding the failed invasion of the Piraeus system and the unknown status of the Executioner's chapter, the Badab War entered a new and uncertain era. The Badab secessionists were unquestionably at their lowest ebb, but equally, the Loyalist forces were in no position to immediately exploit their enemy's weakness and press the attack. This period of the conflict, which lasted from the aftermath of the invasion of Piraeus to the mid divisions of 912 and 41, became known as the Silent War, as it was composed of hundreds of small-scale and petty engagements, cat and mouse duels between long vessels, and bloody but short-lived skirmishes across the region, many of which went all but unreported and unknown. The Maelstrom Zone could not be considered pacified by any means, despite the sundering of the secessionist domains. And it was only the presence of the Loyalist detachments of the Minotaurs and Sosso Medusa chapters that kept the Imperial lines of supply viable. Moreover, it was only the thinly spread Imperial Guard and Inquisition forces attached to the Loyalist Command that kept retaken wars in the Pale Stars region from sliding into anarchy, or succumbing to civil strife as those in the Galen system had. 
Information also soon came to light that the Tyrant's forces were now falling back to the Badab system itself, stripping defenses from worlds such as Isin and the Kabalus and abandoning them to their fates. While some interdiction was attempted against this, the Imperial forces simply didn't have the available manpower or ships in the area to prevent less than a handful of convoys and transports from conducting the retreat. Matters became further confused when it appeared that some forces of the Tyrant's Legion, and even more small splinter groups of Astral Claws, had abandoned their master, turned fully renegade and made an attempt to flee into the Maelstrom Zone, while once again Corsair and Xenos sighting began to increase across the western and southern zone. From facing a single unified enemy, it seemed to the Loyalists that they were on the verge of being left with many fractured foes, whose actions could not be readily predicted, potentially spread out over a vast area of dangerous wilderness space. If the strategic initiative was lost now, or the victory was an incomplete one, some feared, and not without cause, that the conflict could spawn a spreading slow cancer through the region, that might take decades, if not centuries, to quell. In light of this shifting and uncertain situation, the injured but still active Lord Commander Karab Kuln convened a full council of war in 519, 912 and 41, at the newly commissioned Imperial Battle Station complex in the Viania system, to determine a strategy and decide the future course of the war. Present were representatives of all the Loyalist Space Marine chapters still involved in the conflict. Kuln's own Red Scorpions, the Salamanders, Minotaurs, Exorcists, Carcharodons and Sons of Medusa. Despite reservation held by the others, the Firehawk's master, the now ailing Stybor Lazarek, on whom some stain of blame and suspicion of dissent still persisted, was also summoned as an equal. Hope they reserve the spaceman in kind of kids share for him, childish bastard of a chapter master. Inquisitorial legate Jandai's Frain, whose voice was that of the High Lords in the Council, served as Arbiter. And at Frain's personal invitation, a deputation of the Archmagos of the Forge World of Angstrom was also received, and now welcomed as allies to the Loyalist cause. Wait, what? Weren't they neutral? When a battle between the Loyalists and the Astral Claws erupted in their territory, they became the mechanical embodiment of the Anyway, I started blasting meme and attack both sides. You are not wrong, but you see, after the Angstrom incident of 908 and 41, that is explained in detail in part 2, thanks to Legate Inquisitor Frain, a line of dialogue was left open with them, and secret negotiation had been undertaken well in advance of the Grand War Council of 912 and 41. What price or concessions were paid for Angstrom's aid have never been fully as of yet brought to light, but it is known that the negotiations ended with the Pact of Angstrom being created in which they joined the Loyalist cause against Euron and the Secessionists. As it will turn out, their invaluable aid would help the Loyalists immensely during the Siege of Badab itself. Along with fresh demands that the Tyrant be cut from his place of safety on Badab Primaris and brought to the Emperor's judgement as fast as possible, Legate Inquisitor Frain brought to the Council news, both good and ill. The first order of the Council was the acceptance of the formal surrender and repentance of the scattered survivors of the Mantis Warriors chapter, who had finally submitted themselves before the Legate's authority to avoid the utter destruction of their worlds. Less welcome news came when Frain further informed the assembled Space Marines commanders that hoped for reinforcement from the Imperial Guard segmental reserves and fresh warships from the Navy would not be forthcoming. Wars and conflicts were everywhere, and matters pressing against the tyranny threat and newly arising Xenos powers to the Galactic East claimed priority on all that might be gathered to the Loyalist cause on short notice. However, the Inquisitor's agents had at last struck down fresh allies, to whom the Badab conflict would have a far greater resonance than any other concern for reasons of their own. The darkly legended Star Phantom Space Marine chapter were on their way in full strength, and would be with the Loyalists by the end of the year. The Star Phantoms is another dark name that adds itself to the Loyalist forces. They have a troubled history and an extremely soiled reputation in the eyes of the Imperium. They are a chapter created in the 23rd founding, also known as the Sentinel founding of M38. Their descendants is unknown, it is suspected they descend from the Dark Angels, but the Dark Angels themselves have denied any connection, and were instead offended by the mere suggestion the Star Phantoms could descend from their lineage. They are renowned for their death rites, the chapter seemingly being almost obsessed with death and their rites and rituals centered around it. Their first homeworld, the Shrine World of Hakonet, was destroyed and lost to the Void from a millennium, but as they were deployed to the edge of the Imperium in Segmentum Obscurus, it is not surprising that the chapter grew a dark reputation. Their darkest hour came during and after the legendary Makarian Crusade. The Star Phantoms were so unreliable in battle, and so prone to collateral damage against civilians during the quelling of insurrections, that even Lord Solar Makarios himself described them as unsuitable for tactical close support of other Imperial units. 
But the moment that cemented them as mistrusted by the Imperium was in the aftermath of the Macarian Crusade. When after the death of Lord Solar Macarius, the Macarian heresy erupted, and they found themselves in the middle of a civil war between Imperial factions, where they considered everyone their enemy. The Star Phantoms joined the civil war on their own terms, clashing against the generals and war leaders of Macarius that they deemed had betrayed the Imperium. They are listed in certain suppressed sources as being directly responsible for the annihilation of the 17th Terrax Guard on the planet of Thoth, and are known to have engaged in a bloody and protracted conflict with their former allies of the Marines Malevolent, resulting in that chapter's near destruction at their hands. Based, killing Marines Malevolent should be considered the social service in the Imperium of Man. The Star Phantoms became subject to inquisitorial investigation as a result of their actions and were ultimately cleared of heresy, but were nonetheless censored by the Holy Ordos. They were bound into the tankless and dangerous task of partly forming the spearhead of the Imperial Interdiction Campaign of 070 and 41 to end the Macarian heresy. In the aftermath of this short and brutal campaign, which involved elements from over a hundred Space Marine chapters, the Star Phantoms were once again badly reduced in strength, and undertook a self-appointed crusade alone in the southern segmentum Tempestus, attacking isolated orc and chaos-held worlds as they saw fit. Much of their activities afterwards remained shrouded in mystery, until their participation in the brutal closing stages of the Badab War. While they were moving towards the Badab War Zone, further aid was provided by the Adeptus Mechanicus of Angstrom, who both granted a bounty of arms and munitions and also vowed to aid the loyalist attack on Badab when the hour of battle came. Plans and deployments were quickly formulated and put into action, and warriors and warships were swiftly redeployed throughout the Maelstrom zone. In accordance with the loyalist newly formed strategies, and with the hard lesson of Piraus learned, the ultimate goal of the investiture and siege of Badab would now be delayed until overwhelming forces were available. In the meantime, an enhanced blockade and watch would be maintained there, while the Maelstrom zone was brought better under its heel. The Raptorus Rex, the Firehawk's immense mobile fortress monastery, was brought to the Piraeus system to form the linchpin of the reinforced blockade. And on the arrival, the Loyalist Task Force found the Piraeus system, over which so much blood had recently been shed, in an half abandoned state. The lunar colonies of Christia Secundus were ravaged and near lifeless, and Yarrow Station gutted and famine struck by its former masters, and its population left to their fate. A fate which the Raptorus Rex Wrath sealed upon the traitors below by protracted orbital bombardment. Assholes to the very end. Elsewhere in the Maelstrom zone, the Carcharodons were recalled from the Endymion cluster, their work there done in accordance with undertakings given to the Mantis warriors as part of the surrender agreement. Now available for redeployment, the Carcharodon's large fleet, along with ships from the Exorcist and Sons of Medusa chapters, were assigned into small battle groups alongside the Imperial Navy scouting vessels, and dispatched on independent hunter-killer missions throughout the Maelstrom Zone in search of targets of opportunity, as forces for the final assault were steadily assembled, with the cross-world system chosen as their ally in point. 838, 912, and 41. With the Badab War drawing to its bloody conclusion, there remained but a few major matters to settle. And for some of those factions involved on the Loyalist side, the greatest of these remained that of the Executioner's Chapter. It came to pass that the Sons of Medusa and Carcharodon's forces began to coordinate their efforts to hunt down the chapter, and discover a disbelieved center of operations in the Denestellar Drift, with the stated aim of prosecuting a campaign of annihilation against them. Hearing of this as skirmishes and clashes between them began to escalate, the Salamander's captain Pellas Mirsan was deeply troubled. He believed that for all their fury and bloodletting, the executioners had acted with honor during the war, and moreover he felt his own chapter owed them a debt not easily repaid following the events of the Red Hour. With his own small and battered force renewed by the arrival of the Salamander's vanguard cruiser Obsidia, and the half company of Battle Brothers freshly returned from the Segmentum Solar, Mirsan took it upon himself to seek out the leader of the executioners, Tulsa Kane, and parlay a negotiated end to the executioners' part in the war. After a long search along the Maelstrom Zone southern periphery lasting several standard months, the Obsidia rushed to respond to reports of battle joined at the fringes of the Eridian Cataract, and there found the Executioner's Battle Barge Phyton's Wrath and the infamous Night Egg hunting down two damaged Sons of Medusa strike cruisers in the dense asteroid fields and dust clouds of the turbulent star system. Acting without a second thought as to his ship's own safety, Mirsan ordered the Obsidia interposed between the two warring sides and deactivated its own weapons, demanding that an honorable discourse between brothers take place. After a tense standoff in which the Loyalist forces came to the brink of warring among themselves, Mirsan was successful in forcing both sides to stand down, and then start negotiating the Sons of Medusa departure and the Executioner's ceasefire, bringing the Night Tag with Kane aboard, under the Salamander's own personal flag of safety, to formal parley with the Loyalist command. Their voyage to Cross World was shadowed with the war packs of prowling Carcharodon's warships, but they were not attacked. 
Although many on the loyalist side were minded to arrest or even slay the executioners on sight while they were in their power, the voice of Pellas Mirsan, a respected representative of his first founding chapter, was not so easily dismissed. Nor were the likely consequences should blood be shed dishonorably at this juncture. The last people to be dishonorable in front of them ended up losing their heads, literally. Yeah, I interpret this part mostly as the loyalists being wary of past events. Lord Commander Kuhn, seeing the strategic wisdom of removing the dangerous and unpredictable chapter all but bloodlessly from the war, and mindful for the potential for further civil strife in his own rank, acquiesced to Mirsan's proposal regarding the executioners, but with a few added caveats of his own. Under terms of honorable armistice, the executioners were to end all hostilities and quit the region of the Maelstrom Zone entirely, never to return. The bulk of the surviving forces were then to travel to their distant home system, and their oath to remain there until full judgment could later be passed on their actions by a full consistorial court of inquiry. Their leader, Tulsa Kane, his chosen honor guard and crew, along with the night tag, voluntarily gave themselves over to the Salamander's custody, and were interned at the Salamander's chapter world of Noxure until the end of the war. The Salamander's chapter themselves would from this point stand as guarantor of the executioner's compliance and conduct, although there remain those on the loyalist side who, though bound to obedience in the matter, will never forget the bad blood they had with the executioners. And now, Pio, we are at the end of the war. Many people have fought for both sides. Many people have died. There isn't enough dead Minotaurs yet to satisfy my thirst for vengeance. I will avenge my boys the Lamenters. But now we are entering the real end. The Badab war has finally reached the doors of Badab itself. 117, 913, and 41. With the arrival of the Grimstar Phantoms chapter fleet, carrying a powerful force fully 10 companies strong, and also a manipul of battle titans of Legio Crucius, also known as the Warmongers, brought in by the intervention of the Mechanicus of Angstrom, and with several heavy warships such as the Sword of Ordon brought back into full operation, at last the Siege of Badab itself could begin. The initial attack itself will not be easy, as Badab's infamous Ring of Steel Space Defense Globe held sufficient firepower to hold off almost any fleet of attackers, and had turned the void between its planet into a deadly maze of minefields and interlocking fire zones. No star system could be made impregnable, however, as history had proved countless times, and the Loyalist High Command had come up with an unorthodox plan to sunder the Ring of Steel with minimal losses, allowing for an immediate planetary assault. The key to this plan was twofold, and it relied both on the arcane arts of the Magos of Angstrom and the effects of the Tyrant's growing paranoia. The Ring of Steel's greatest vulnerability was that it was largely static. The positions of its various minefields and massively armed star force were predictable and what few defense ships and armed vessels of any size Badab still possessed were insufficient to turn the tide against a concerted localized attack. The cornerstone of the outer system defense was the heavily defended star fortress orbiting Sigma, also known as Badab VI. Here loyalist spies had discovered that contained a Sentinel Sigma was the primary node of control, which the tyrant had placed in charge of one of the few subordinates he truly trusted, the infamous Astral Close Captain Corian Sumatris. This was done rather than devolve the star force and minefields control autonomously in the ends of scores of commanders he thought unreliable. If Sentinel Sigma could be taken intact, then the legendary big guns of the Badab system could be silenced permanently. On 317, 913 and 41, the lowest assault armada entered real space in the Badab system, high up on the vertical plane of the planetary system, directly on an attack course for Badab 6. The armada consisted of no fewer than 6 space marine battle barges and 9 strike cruisers, along with 6 other Imperial Navy ships of the line, an Adeptus Mechanicus war caravel and 84 escort and strike vessels of various classes. At its vanguard was the Raptorus Rex, behind which, thanks to the artisanship of the Magos of Angstrom, was towed a burning stellar core fragment torn bodily from the Bale Cascade. As the war machines of Badab sprang to life in response to the threat, thousands of gun batteries powered up, and drifting clouds of assassin mines woke up to murderous intent. But as their auger beams and targeting sensoria swept the oncoming armada, it was already too late to prevent what was to happen next. Swiftly reaching terminal velocity, the ponderous cyclopean bulk of the Raptorus Rex engaged its main drive at maximum power, to alter course. Straining against inertia to allow the hellish fire of the stellar fragment to pass it by on its collision course with the Sentinel Sigma battle station, while the Loyalist Armada spell into a spearhead formation, a safe distance behind. Did, did they just throw the fragment of a star against their enemies? Yes, the War of the Tax Evasion has now arrived to this level. Imagine something so cool done by such a stupid chapter as the Fire Oaks. The Sentinel Sigma Station had no hope of escaping the path of the Rogue Star Fragment in time, and faced certain destruction should it impact. 
If it fell, a yawing gap would be blown clear through the ring of steel, and the control lab of the entire outer system defenses would be annihilated at a stroke. Soon every weapon on the defense line within range and resolution of the immense tumbling fireball let loose. Tens of thousands of mass-driven projectiles, torpedoes and macro shells filled the void, hurling towards the dense amorphous mass of nuclear plasma and elemental force. Most were spent fruitlessly, exploding and incinerating in his superheated corona before they could reach his core. Blinded by the light of this new and terrible star careering towards them, the weapons of the Ring of Steel could not clearly see, let alone target the oncoming armada. And legions of mines and weapon platforms, their targeted arrays maddened by the conflagration, set upon each other and set off waves of atomic detonations through the void, lighting up the skies of the inner worlds with an omen of coruscating fire. Only at a near point blank range did the defense lasers and arc cannons of the Star Force begin to take a toll on the burning mass, their beams tearing gauss of burning matter clear, until at last they punched their way deep into the unstable core and the fragment was torn apart in a great wave of energy, which washed over the Sentinel Sigma, painting its failing void shields with lambent flame and burning through defense ships and fighters in a torrent of destruction. There was no relenting from the apocalyptic cataclysm the loyalists had unleashed, and hard on the wake of the energy storm came the Angels of Death. Boarding torpedoes and assault rams smashed into the reeling Sentinel Sigma, carrying with them the might of the Sons of Medusa and Exorcist chapters, and were met in deadly combat amid the station vaults and corridors by battle servitors and the suicidal fury of the vaunted Astral Close Second Company and their master, the Arch Swordsman Corian Sumatris. As this action raged, the battle barges Sword of Ordon and the Star Phantom's Memento Mori led a wing of strike cruisers to assault the burned and blinded Starfort network at point blank range, taking one after the other intact in a series of brutal boarding assaults which left none they found within alive. Meanwhile, the Minotaurs carried out strikes upon the system's other inhabited spheres of Badab Secandus and Rigeal, decapitating their governments and military commands with brutal efficiency. Lord Asterion Moloch, the darkly famed master of the Minotaurs, hurled the members of Badab Secandus ruling satrapy from from the spire of his oratory cathedral. This he did after impaling the astral close chaplain Varna Sabin to the front of his personal land raider transport, as an example to traitors of the fate that awaited them. When at last Vylon Kal, Iron Tain of the Sons of Medusa, communicated from atop a mound of broken bodies that Sentinel Sigma was theirs, he was joined via teleporter by the Mechanicus Lords of Angstrom. Within hours, they had achieved what Lufthuron and his court considered unthinkable, the subjugation of the station Silica Animus and with it access to the many machine spirits and weapons slaved to it. Incontrovertible override and destruct signals were sent out across the void, a function only possible because of the possessive paranoia of a single man to control a system so large. In response, the command of the outer Badab system became a sea of fire. The Ring of Steel was shattered, and now the Loyalists set their gaze to their final objective remaining, Badab Primaris and the defenses that encircled it, the last bastion left to the Astral Close Power and the personal fortress of Luft Euron. 118, 913, and 41. With the star system now under Loyalist control and surviving defense ships hunted down and destroyed, deployments were quickly put into place to surround and besiege Badab Primaris, with the ships of the Exorcist chapter along with the Imperial Navy detachments breaking off to blockade the star system, to ensure none would escape what was to come. The assault from orbit against Badab Primaris was to have been spearheaded by the Raptorus Rex, but that was no longer possible, the strain of the core fragment attack having caused significant structural damage, which destabilized the engines of the vast craft, making close orbital operations impossible. The guns of Badab Primaris were still to be greatly feared, and it was a forlorn hope that even a Space Marine battle barge would survive long if they could not be silenced quickly by orbital counter-battery fire. The Star Phantoms had asked for and been granted the glory of leading the first wave, and it was their ancient battle barge, the Memento Mori, which would be the first to brave the guns of Badab. Further hazard to the assault was presented by the High Guard Orbital Station, which the Astral Close had first used as a fortress monastery, before Luft Euron had descended to take over the Palace of Thorns below. The hastily revised attack plan was to be a three-pronged offensive. The first axis of attack would be formed by two companies of Star Phantoms Space Marines attacking the High Guard Orbital Fortress, in concert with the smaller Firehawks and Sons of Medusa contingents. For the second, the Carcharodons would descend in full force to the surface of Badab Primaris Hives, to crush any opposition. The third and most vital attack force would be formed by the bulk of the Star Phantoms, some seven companies in strength, assisted by heavy assault elements drawn from across Loyalist chapters and Inquisitorial Stormtroopers companies. This would take the battle to the ear of the foe and besiege the Palace of Thorns itself. The attack was heralded by waves of orbital bombardment and hard debris from orbit, sent to sow havoc below as weapons fire split the heavens above Badab Primarius. 
The sable form of the Memento Mori led the attack, and was rocked with explosions as it breached the upper atmosphere, its own cannons roaring in answer, and vortex missiles screaming out from its weapons decks to reap great wounds in the planet's crust. Behind the dauntless battle barge, dozens of other warships swept low to unleash their deadly cargo. Blazing bright lances of energy pierced upwards, and the skies darkened as wave after wave of drop pods painted in midnight black and cold grey rained down in precisely executed assaults. Brighter yet, from the hollow edge of space, the Carcharodon's relic flagship Nikor unleashed the vast plasma destructor weapon concealed in its belly, and burned a great trench in Badab's surface, sundered the bastion wall of Badab Primary's main city, Hive Dominar, and soon after Thunderhawks and Assault Rams spiraled down to exploit the breach. Such was the burning pole of smoke, swirling cinder ash and choking dust that came up, that night fell over Badab's northern continent as the siege assault raged, the darkness riven with meteoric streaks of flame as wreckage fell from high above. A full hour had passed since the first shots were fired, and still the defense batteries had not yet been fully silenced, but many were now choked off or destroyed. Troop ships and Thunderhawks continued to descend perilously to the storm of smoke and fire, ferrying their reinforcements and heavy armor down to the tumult of battle. Deeming the approach now safe, like a hammer of the gods, the colossal landing craft of the Legio Crucius fell on Earth outside of Hive Dominar, their impact sending a powerful tremor shock through the ground, bringing yet more of the breached bastion wall tumbling down. Vast armored doors opened and slammed buildings flat as titans walked on Badab, their bellowing sirens echoing like a call of doom for the world. The assault moved into its second and then third hour without any sign of relenting, and soon Hive Dominar had become a city of death. Within its hundreds of kilometers of multi-tiered roadways and vast arched habitation towers, the Terran's Legion fought an insane and desperate battle against the grey giants that had come among them. Transit junctions were soon clogged with burning vehicles and shattered rubble, and for the fresh civilians trapped within the Doomed Hive, there was nothing but terror and death. Offering no chance of surrender or survival, the soldiers of the Auxilia bitterly fought on as best they cooled, as the Carcharodons fell on them with nightmarish fury, savagely hacking through their defense lines and leaving nothing but torn bodies and shattered war machines in their wake. In the face of the unstoppable grey red tide that had come upon them, all pretense of command and control within the Tyrant's Legion rapidly broke down, as Vox sets uttered nothing but screams and unanswered pleas for mercy. Fires began to spread out of control, and the carnage was only worsened as those isolated Legion Redabouts and tank squadrons that still survived began to shell indiscriminately into the shadows of buildings. Their desperate and chaotic attacks were in the vain hope of fighting an enemy that came at them with terrifying speed, only to fade away and strike again, each time leaving fewer and fewer alive. To the northeast of Hive Dominar lay the Palace of Thorns, built into the mountain's volcanic plateau that rose high above the level of the Hive City. It comprised a whole King Hornate citadel, surrounded by wide statue-lined plazas and minaret-capped gun towers, studded with defense lasers and flak batteries. This was the art of the Astral Close Domain and the lair of the Tyrant of Badab. Above the palace complex center, an actinic bright lighting shield rippled and clashed in the air, a vast charged power field that disintegrated anything it touched and shrugged off even the firepower of the warships above. The plasma and weapons batteries that spread out beyond the palace were not so impervious, however, and it was into them the Star Phantoms descended with unmatched precision and timing, their drop pods smashing down through the ornate sepulchres and toppling needle-thin auspex masts as they descended. Despite the blizzard of fire that had greeted them, over 500 battle brothers out of the 700 strong force survived to make landfall, and now they set about besieging the heavily protected palace. The combat was as fierce as any the chapter had seen, and at every turn the star phantoms encountered death traps and heavily defended gun positions. They fought brutal close range engagements with astral close assault squads who counter attacked them from concealed sally ports, paying in blood for every advance. Further in, land raiders and predators spilled from underground bunkers in defense of the citadel's shield wall, their power matched by the deadly accurate fire of Star Phantom's devastator squads and dreadnoughts firing from the shattered towers they had already stormed. The siege soon descended into a blood meat grinder, as the wide open plazas that ringed the citadel became little killing grounds, which offered scant cover to attacker or defender alike. For every two gun ziggurats that were taken by the Star Phantoms, another held out and was retaken by counter assault, and soon the siege lines became a confused anarchy where the enemy could be encountered on all sides. 
Slowly, though, the bloody siege of the palace outer precinct began to tip in the loyalists' favor. As making their way up the volcanic ridges, stormtrooper reinforcements joined the fray, allowing the Star Phantoms to press the attack. While loyalists terminate all squads, locked on to the Star Phantoms' teleport homers, were dispatched to the surface from strike cruisers braving the much reduced ground fire. But despite the massive force brought to bear against it, still the citadel held. The Palace of Thorns' lighting shield remained unbreached. An attack after attack was hurled away from its citadel by murderous counter attack and deadly fire rained down from the walls. The attacker's losses mounted steadily, and even the river titans of the Legio Crucius, alongside fresh sons of Medusa detachments, could not force the advance. Indeed, the first titan to attempt the attack was disabled as it sought to lend its firepower to the assault, its command deck gutted by a well placed conversion beamer blast in the shadows of the citadel. The siege of the Palace of Thorns was at a little impasse. As true night fell over Hive Dominar and the Palace of Thorns, the fighting and killing had went on uninterrupted, spreading out to the planet Saba and industrial zones. The pall of smoke from Badab's burning cities thickened the night to an umbral black, deep enough to fog the aspects of the ships in orbit, and the planet to them becoming a mass of undistinguishable heat blooms from the fires below. Titans stalked the benighted and ruined the cityscapes, their powerful weapons lighting up the darkness like thunderstorms, as their footfall shook the earth, crushing any hint of resistance they encountered and systematically smashing manufacturing and habitation blocks. The Titans' machine spirit and crews reveled in the desolation they brought, Driving waves of screaming refugees had routed the Legion troopers before them in a disordered swarm. Meanwhile, the Carcharodons haunted the shadows of the Badav Ives like blood painted grey spectres. The city was theirs. Of Luft Euron's action during this long night of destruction, little can be said for certain. Some reports have the tyrants sighted almost everywhere in the defense of the palace, hurling back the rent and shattered bodies of his enemies, roaring his defiance, while other tales place him alone and silent in the throne chamber, impassively watching the destruction of all he had wrought in the flickering light of his holosphere. Regardless of the truth, what can be accurate said is that no astral clause surrendered to their fate. Each fought to the end, whether at the Palace of Thorns, in the Hive Cities of Badab, or in the defense of the High Guard Orbital Station, the astral clause sold their lives in a blaze of fury and spite. The catacomb tunnel was narrow and filled with smoke, but his arm's respirator cleared it easily, and the air brought with it the taste of scorched flesh and cindered stone. Just as easily, his augmented sight pierced the dust and smoke, and made out the shape of a larger junction chamber beyond. Veteran Sergeant Wotan raised his gauntleted hand, and the star phantoms behind him fell still. Above them, the labyrinthine halls and galleries of the Palace of Thorns shook and thundered, and dust rained down as another titanic blast struck the citadel. The boosted aspects in his other hand rolled with static, its signal strangled by the basalt block walls and the ionizing radiation that flooded the sub-levels. A flicker, there for a second, and then gone. A heavy contact ahead of them in the catacombs on the other side of the junction chamber. He gestured rapidly with his raised hand, flashing a complex pattern in the chapters on battle sign. An invaluable tool on a battlefield where Vox signals were easily compromised and the enemy were once brothers. Wotan's instructions were simple and quickly obeyed. Advance immediately and engage. Trap the enemy in the confines of the tunnel before they could do the same to Wotan's squad. The six star phantoms fanned out, silent but the crunch of their armored boots on the dusty mosaic floor. As a chapter, they knew no battle cry nor needed one to vent their martial spirit. Their gift was death, and all were welcome in its cold embrace. The enemy rose up from the smoke. Hulking figures of crimson daub, tarnished steel, shadowy mirrors to the star phantom's pale armored forms, armed and armored as they were. It was as if they fought themselves reflected as through a glass darkly. The moment's illusion ended as blades crashed, sending sparks fountaining and bolt shells screaming through the air, a hand's breath away from Wotan's arm. The astral claws bellowing roars answered only by grim silence as the dying began. Wotan backhanded a parry with his gun hand against the astral claw that lunged to meet his charge. Turning into the blow, Wotan brought up his sickle blade power sword and opened up the enemy before him from crotch to gullet, the stench of molten metal and bloody steam washing over him as he kicked his foe away. Moving again, bolt shells smashed into his shoulder pauldron as he located his next target and a frag grenade went off nearby, the flesh and sound washing over him like water. Two steps later, Wotan was down on one knee. The muzzle of his bolt pistol pressed against the temple of a wounded Astra Claw, who was struggling to rise. He pulled the trigger once and the traitor's shattered faceplate bounced off the mosaic floor amid a black liquid rush. His auto senses told him two of his squad were slain, but his alacrity had been rewarded and the enemy's tally of dead was much higher. A sudden movement glimmered in the dark. 
A fast-moving boat, almost too fast to be a space marine, came at him. Only his enhanced reflexes prevented the swinging thunder hammer from pulverizing him where he stood. Instead, the black armored body hit him square on and he was shunted off his feet and thrown to the floor. He rolled twice and slammed into the chamber wall. The force of the running figure had hit him like a mag train. In an instant, he took in the armored form that had struck him down. The black of its armor marked it different from the rest, and tattered prayer scrolls and purity seals fluttered from rents in the space bearing ceramite plating, which opened to gaping bloody wounds. On the black armored space bearing shoulder was the scabbed remains of white chiqui and the red symbol, which was enough to confirm Wotan's suspicions. The murderous figure willed again and let out a cry, as much of anguish as rage, and brought the hammer down on the back of one of Wotan's star phantoms who was trading blows with an enemy of his own. There was an explosive crack as the backpack was smashed to pieces, and the hammer crushed the life from the star phantom, who then collapsed like a bundle of rags. Still in his prone position against the wall, Wotan calmly ejected the half-spent magazine from his bolt pistol and fed in another, slipping the fire selector to storm. Taking careful aim, he waited for the black armored space marine to wheel around again in search of another victim, and chose his moment precisely. A tongue of flame lashed from the pistol's muzzle, and the explosive bolts flew straight and true into the exposed joint at the back of his enemy's knee, which came apart in a gout of shrapnel and clotted flesh dropping Wotan's target onto his back. Wotan rose again to his feet and reclaimed his power sword from where it had buried itself in the mosaic floor. As the weapon hummed to life in his gauntleted hand, he thought, even angels may fall. He gave no sound as he swung the blade down. For those that didn't get it, he was fighting a Lamenter's Dead Company Marine. My boys! At the dawn of the second day of the assault, the Karcharodons took matter in their own hands to bring about the end. Assigned by Lord Commander Kuhn the task of attacking the planet's infrastructure and preventing an organized defense from taking root, they had devised their own plan of doing so, and set their own deadly measure to the extremes to which they would go. Having ravaged the Terran's Legion forces defending the cities, and setting the hives ablaze, they continued to the final stage of their plan, and dispatched strike teams deep into the hive's subsurface. There, they sabotaged the vast and ancient atomic and geothermal reactors which powered the hives, and fed the hungry planetary defense batteries with energy. Across Badab Primaris, power failed, or suddenly spiked, adding to the chaos. And slowly, with an exorable horror, the hives began to quake, and the towers of Badab toppled like falling trees. Silently and in good order, the Karcharodons began to withdraw from the surface. The fatal blow struck, the God Emperor's judgment on treacherous Badab delivered. Few realized just what had begun, and at the Palace of Thorns, the sudden destabilization of power had offered the loyalists a much needed opening in which to strike. As the lightning field and the citadels of their defenses flickered for a moment before drawing power again from their own reactors, a Star Phantom's assault force managed to breach the lower level bunker network and catacombs. With Captain Zurkai Androcles at its head, this force of assault equipped Space Marines and Terminators finally forced their way into the citadel and the ear of the enemy. The Star Phantom's assault was brutal and relentless, its passage blasted through by thunder hammer rent bulkheads and charge blown walls, while the astral claws that fought against them were the most fanatical and hate-filled of their breed. Their crimson splattered armor devoid of any sign of their former service as defenders of the Imperium. Chain blades flashed and the bolters roared in the closest confines in the Under Citadel, as the ossuaries of the Astral Claws chapter were blasted apart, as each side slaughtered the other in an hellish struggle. All over Badab, the ground began to quake and shudder. As high above in orbit, Auguris registered the massive tectonic upheaval in the planet's sub structures, radiating out across ancient geological fault lines, spewing molten magma and radioactive ash up from the Earth. Badab Primaris began to die. At the Palace of Thorns, the Bastion Wall was finally breached, collapsing the Lightning Shield. The Star Phantom stormed the Citadel, much of which was now no more than a rubble-strand butcher's yard. At the height of this desperate last battle at the palace, Luft Euron was mortally wounded by the dying Star Phantom's captain Zurkal Androclis. Records recovered after the battle from the Autosense logs of the Star Phantoms indicate a brutal melee erupt in between Androclis forces and the Tyrant's personal guard, to their near mutual destruction in one of the palace deep sub-levels. And it is likely Euron's party were attempting to flee to a concealed escape craft via the subsurface. Captain Androclis was struck down by the Tyrant in the confrontation, who is in arrogance strode over the fallen hero believing him dead. As his life bled from him, the grimly determined Star Phantom's captain succeeded in discharging his combi melt at the looming figure of Luft Euron, at point-blank range. The Melta Blast struck the arcane lightning claw the Tyrant habitually wore, which catastrophically exploded, unleashing a baleful pulse of energy. 
this blast incinerated Taran's arm and much of his right side, and the remnants of his burning armor collapsing to the ground was the last image recorded by the fallen captain's autosensors. Soon afterward, when a star phantom squad entered the vault, they found the bloody remains of the melee, along with shrapnel and organic detritus later identified by the Megos biologists of the Constitutorial Court as belonging to Euron. The bulk of Luft Euron's body, however, was not found nor were any remains that could be later identified as belonging to the Astral Close Master of the Forge, Armanneos Valtex, who had also been present in the combat. Further investigation of the matter, or deeper exploration of the lower levels of the Palace of Thorns, proved impossible, however, as the planet of Badab Primaris began to suffer greater and greater calamities. So that is why in every artwork of Euron Blackheart, the right side of his armor is a mess and his right arm is over disproportionate compared to the other. Yes, Pio. Valtex, the master of the Forge of the Astral Close, saved Euron's life, and rebuilt the parts of his body missing. Euron Blackheart's right side is all robotical prosthetics, this is why he looks so weird. Beneath the eyes of Badab Primaris, the cascading destruction of the deep sunk reactor cores was taking its tolls. Tectonic shocks and volcanic eruptions were increasing at an exponential rate, and entire hive sectors collapsed into gaping moles that opened in the ground beneath them, to be replaced by seas of lava. The campaign of purgation and conquest of Badab quickly devolved into an archic retreat, and many were caught in the path of destruction. Wherever they could be found, interface vessels of any and all kinds were commandeered by loyalists and renegades alike, in a desperate effort to flee the planet. In the anarchy and ruin that followed the fall of the Hive cities, the air was filled with toxic ash and fallout, and the majority of the planet's population are estimated to have been exterminated within a few standard days. Confusion reigned in the wreckage stewing system. Several loyalist transports were also shot down by the blockade ships, and it is believed that at least one small warp-capable privateer vessel managed to escape the Badass system into the warp. Later intelligence reports suggest that less than 200 secessionist survivors were on board, led by Armanneos Valtex, and carrying with them Euron's broken body. The Badab war was finally over. But this is not everything. We will cover in part 4 the aftermath for all parties involved in the war, both loyalists and traitors. So, we are not done yet, but we are almost there. Now, Pio, what kind of message do you take from this entire story of crushed ambition and madness-driven rage? That endless ambition isn't a good thing, that you must set limits for yourself to keep your sanity, and that all of this could have been avoided if the damn Dai Lords of Terra decided to assign a fourth chapter to help the warders of the Maelstrom, instead of then using more than a dozen to fight Euron and all of his forces. No, Pio, from this entire story we learned that both people are evil in 40k. We have Erebus, Horus, Abaddon, and now Euron. I... what? First thing, Abaddon isn't even bold. He has to be there, which is different. Secondly, I doubt this is the moral of the story of the Badab War. Are you contradicting me, Pio? Yes, I am. <sighs> <sighs> Do you have so much fun tormenting Pio in these videos? You joking, tormenting Pio is what makes this job bearable. We want to thank George Orla Balayan for his stunning custom-made artworks for our narration to illustrate. All of his links are in the description. The story of the Badab War will end in part 4, the aftermath of a bloody civil war.